Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Isn't it? Yes, it is. Yeah. Um, is there anything in place to allow that to happen at the moment? Well, because there's some suggestion that Article 50 should be paused for some yeah, time. Yeah, so you, if you want to pause Article 50, you would have to go and seek permission from another EU 27 question, uh, countries to do that. But in terms of uh, the European Court of Justice's ruling today, uh, they're of the view we can revoke it on our own terms without having to ask permission. Now, no doubt people who want a second referendum will seize on that as further momentum towards that cause. Um, I think that is the last thing Theresa May would want to do at most. She would probably pause it, but not delay. OK, so the Prime Minister is... Uh, James Brokenshire is still speaking just at the moment. As I said, the former Northern Ireland Secretary, I'm sure he's glad that he doesn't have to deal with those negotiations just at the moment. He has been quite poorly, of course, now back in, house, uh, in the chamber. House, Prime Minister, I think, is in the House, likely to hear from her shortly. Yeah. Um, and there has been some debate as well about whether or not... Um, the government might not be able to delay this vote but but interestingly um, Nigel Evans there was pretty clear wasn't he he said actually the way they've organized the debate the whips is that every morning a minister has to move the motion um, it could be coming on any time now but every morning a minister has to move uh, a business motion which means they can just not move it tomorrow and then there isn't a vote but as Nigel was also saying, Nigel Evans, that might mean that Labour then table this censor motion, censure motion. That's slightly different. Yeah, I know that the gallery are trying to speak to me in London. Obviously, they're aware that the people are shouting very loudly behind me, so I'm sure they can communicate with the producers and let us know what they're yeah, trying to say. Yeah, we can barely on, hear ourselves, can we? Um, a censure motion is slightly different from a no-confidence vote. A censure motion is a, a rebuke in strongest possible terms to either the government or the Prime Minister. Labour might try and table that in the hope that the DUP are so furious with her that they might support them in a censure motion for the Prime Minister. It wouldn't, it wouldn't lead to the collapse of her government or anything like that in the way a no-confidence uh, motion could, but it would put maximum political pressure on her as she tries to go into those renegotiations. Um, where is she as far as uh, credibility with the party is concerned? Well, it's so funny you say that because as I was walking across the green about half an hour ago to come up here, I ran into an MP and he just leaned over to me and he went, what a shambles, and off he walked. And I think behind the scenes, uh, MPs are in absolute despair as to what's been going on about the insistence of pressing on with this vote, even when it was really clear from a week to 10 days ago that opposition was huge and if anything it was hardening and I think that many MPs privately are really dismayed that she has marched everyone up the hill only to march them back down again and that Were could have been... Were you surprised that she put out her uh, big names um, over the weekend in order to say that the vote will still go ahead? No, because I, I think in politics this is, all, this is what happens publicly everything is going ahead until it, it's not going ahead anymore OK, and let's she's hear... Up from the Prime Minister. The European Union. We've now had three days of debate on the withdrawal agreement, setting out the terms of our departure from the EU and the political declaration setting out our future relationship after we have left. I've listened very carefully to what has been said in this chamber and out of it. <laughs> to what has been said in this chamber and out of it by members from all sides. From listening to those views, it is clear that while there is broad support for many of the key aspects of the deal, on one issue, on one issue, the Northern Ireland backstop, there remains widespread and deep concern. As a result, if we went ahead and held the vote tomorrow, the deal would be rejected by a significant margin. We will therefore defer the vote schedule for tomorrow and not proceed to divide the House at this time. I set out in my speech opening the debate last week the reasons why the backstop is a necessary guarantee to the people of Northern Ireland 
and why, whatever future relationship you want, there is no deal available that does not include the backstop. Behind all those arguments are some inescapable facts. The fact that Northern Ireland shares a land border with another sovereign state. The fact, the fact that the hard-won peace the fact that the hard-won peace that has been built in Northern Ireland over the last two decades has been built around a seamless border, and the fact that Brexit will create a wholly new situation. On the 30th of March, the Northern Ireland-Ireland border will for the first time become the external frontier of the European Union's single market and customs union. The challenge the challenge this poses must be met, not with rhetoric, but with real and workable solutions. Businesses operate across that border. People live their lives crossing and recrossing it every day. I've been there and spoken to some of those people. They do not want their everyday lives to change as a result of the decision we have taken. They do not want a return to our hard border. And if this House cares about preserving our union, it must listen to those people, because our union will only endure with their consent. We had hoped that the changes we have secured to the backstop would reassure members that we could never be trapped in it indefinitely. I hope the House will forgive me if I take a moment to remind it of those changes. The customs element of the backstop is now UK-wide. It no longer splits our country into two customs territories. This also means that the backstop is now an uncomfortable arrangement for the EU, so they won't want it to come into use or persist for long if it does. Both sides are now legally committed to using best endeavours to have our new relationship in place before the end of the implementation period, ensuring the backstop is never used. If our new relationship isn't ready, we can now choose to extend the implementation period further reducing the likelihood of the backstop coming into use. If the backstop ever does come into use, we now don't have to get the new relationship in place to get out of it. Alternative arrangements that make use of technology could be put in place instead. The treaty, the treaty is now clear that the backstop can only ever be temporary, and there is now a termination clause. But I, but I am clear. What I, from what I have heard in this place and from my own conversations, that these elements do not offer a sufficient number of colleagues the reassurance that they need. <laughs> I spoke to a number of EU leaders over the weekend, and in advance of the European Council, I will go to see my counterparts in other member states and the leadership of the Council and the Commission. I will discuss with them the clear concerns that this House has expressed. We are also looking closely at new ways of empowering the House of Commons to ensure that any provision for a backstop has democratic legitimacy and to enable the House to place its own obligations on the government to enable the House to place its own obligations on the government to ensure that the backstop cannot be in place indefinitely. Mr Speaker, having spent the best part of two years poring over the detail of Brexit, listening to the public's ambitions and, yes, their fears too, and testing the limits of what the other side is prepared to accept, I am in absolutely no doubt that this deal is the right one. It honours the result of the referendum. It Order. The remainder of the statement must be heard, and I invite the House to hear it with courtesy, and for the avoidance of doubt and also the benefit of those attending to our proceedings who are not <laughs> members of the House, I emphasise that, as per usual, I will call everyone who wants to question the Prime Minister. But meanwhile, please hear her. The Prime Minister. It honours the result of the referendum. It protects jobs, security and our union. But it also represents the very best deal that is actually negotiable with the EU. I believe in it, as do many members of this House. And I still believe there is a majority to be won in this House in support of it, if I can secure additional reassurance on the question of the backstop. And that is what my focus will be in the days ahead. But, Mr Speaker, if you take a step back, it is clear that this House faces a much more fundamental question. Does this House want to deliver Brexit? <laughs> And 
and uh, a, clear, a clear message from the SNP, but if the House does, does it want to do so through reaching an agreement with the EU? If the answer is yes, and I believe that is the answer of the majority of this House, then we all have to ask ourselves whether we are prepared to make a compromise, because there will be no enduring and successful Brexit without some compromise on both sides of the debate. Many of the most controversial aspects of this deal, including the backstop, are simply inescapable facts of having a negotiated Brexit. Those members who continue to disagree need to shoulder the responsibility of advocating an alternative solution that can be delivered and do so, and do so without ducking its implications. So if you want a second referendum to overturn the result of the first, be honest that this risks dividing the country again. Be honest that this risks dividing the country again, when as a House we should be striving to bring it back together. If you, if you want to remain part of the single market and the customs union, be open that this would require free movement, rule taking across the economy, and ongoing financial contributions, none of which are, in my view, compatible with the result of the referendum. If you, and if, if you want to leave without a deal, be upfront that in the short term this would cause significant economic damage to parts of our country who can least afford to bear the burden. Yep. I do not believe that any of those courses of action command a majority in this House. But notwithstanding that fact, for as long as we fail to agree a deal, the risk of an accidental no deal increases. So the Government, so the government will step up its work in preparation for that potential outcome and the Cabinet will hold further discussions on it this week. The vast majority of us, Mr Speaker, accept the result of the referendum and want to leave with a deal. We have a responsibility to discharge. If we will the ends, we must also will the means. And I know that members across the House appreciate how important that responsibility is. And I'm very grateful to all members on this side of the House and a few on the other side too who have backed this deal and spoken up for it. Many, many, others, many others I know have been wrestling with their consciences, particularly over the question of the backstop, seized of the need to face up to the challenge posed by the Irish border, but genuinely concerned about the consequences. I have listened, I have heard those concerns, and I will now do everything I possibly can to secure further assurances. If I may conclude, Mr Speaker, on a personal note, on the morning after the referendum two and a half years ago, I knew that we had witnessed a defining moment for our democracy. Places that didn't get a lot of attention at elections and which did not get much coverage on the news were making their voices heard and saying that they wanted things to change. I knew in that moment that Parliament had to deliver for them. But of course, that doesn't just mean delivering Brexit. It means working across all areas, building a stronger economy, improving public services, tackling, tackling, tackling social injustices, to make this a country that truly works for everyone. Uh, the Prime Minister must be heard. The Prime Minister. Tackling social injustices, to make this a country that truly works for everyone a country where nowhere and nobody is left behind. And these matters are too important to be afterthoughts in our politics. They deserve to be at the centre of our thinking. But that can only happen if we get Brexit done and get it done right. And even though I voted Remain, from the moment I took up the responsibility of being Prime Minister of this great country, I've known that my duty is to honour the result of that vote. And I've been just as determined to protect the jobs that put food on the tables of working families and the security partnerships and the security partnerships that keep each one of us safe. And that's what this deal does. It gives us control of our borders, our money and our laws. It protects jobs, security and our union. It is the right deal for Britain. 
I am determined to do all I can to secure the reassurances this House requires to get this deal over the line and deliver for the British people, and I commend this statement to the House. Jeremy Corbyn! Thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Prime Minister for a copy of the statement before we, we met here this afternoon. We are in an extremely serious and unprecedented situation. The Government has lost control of events and is in complete disarray. Yep. Yes. It has been evident for weeks that the Prime Minister's deal did not have the confidence of this House. Right. Yet she ploughed on regardless, reiterating yeah. this is the only deal available. Can she be clear with the House? Is she seeking changes to the deal or mere reassurances? Does she therefore accept the statement from the European Commission at lunchtime saying that it was the only deal possible, we will not renegotiate, our position has not changed? Ireland's Taoiseach, Leo Varadkar, has said it is not possible to renegotiate the Irish border backstop, stating that it was the Prime Minister's own red lines that made the backstop necessary. Exactly. Exactly. So can the Prime Minister be clear? Is she now ready to drop further red lines in order to make progress? Yeah. Mr Speaker, can the Prime Minister confirm that the deal presented to this House is not off the table but will be represented with a few assurances. Bringing back the same botched deal either next week or in January, and can she be clear on the timing, will not change its fundamental flaws and deeply held objections right across this House, which go far wider than the backstop alone. Yes. Mr Speaker, this is a bad deal for Britain, a bad deal for our economy and a bad deal for our democracy. Our country deserves better than this. Yes. The real damage... The, the deal... The deal damages our economy, and it isn't just the opposition saying that. The government's own analysis shows this deal would make us worse off. Yeah. If the Prime Minister cannot be clear that she can and will renegotiate a deal, then she must make way. And if she is and, Mr Speaker, if she is going back to Brussels, then she needs to build a consensus in this House. Yeah. And since it appears business has changed for the next two days, then it seems not only possible but necessary that this House debates the negotiating mandate that the Prime Minister takes to Brussels. Exactly. There is no point, no point at all, in this Prime Minister bringing back the same deal again, which clearly does not support the, is not supported by this House. Yeah. Mr Speaker, we've endured two years of shambolic negotiations, yes. red lines which have been boldly announced, then cast aside. Yeah. We're now on our third Brexit secretary, and it appears each one of them has been excluded from these vital negotiations. We were promised a precise and substantive document and got a vague 26-page wish list. And they become the first government ever in British history to be held in contempt of Parliament. The government is in disarray. Uncertainty is building for business. People are in despair at the state of these failed negotiations and concerned about what it means about their jobs, their livelihood and their communities. And the fault for that lies solely at the door of this shambolic government. Yeah. The Prime Minister is trying to buy herself one last chance to save this deal. If she doesn't take on board the fundamental changes required, then she must make way for those who can. Yeah. Yeah. Can I, I think, can I...
hope I can respond fairly uh, briefly to the Right Honourable Gentleman. The Right Honourable Gentleman appeared to argue, on one hand, that it wasn't possible to change the deal because the EU had said this was the only deal, and on the other hand, that the only thing he would accept was the deal being renegotiated. No, the Right Honourable Gentleman quoted the European Union as saying this was the only deal, and then goes on to say that the whole deal needs to be renegotiated. This is the, the fundamental question that members of this House have to ask themselves is whether they wish to deliver Brexit and honour the result of the referendum. If you wish to deliver, all the analysis shows that if you wish to deliver Brexit, if you wish to honour the result of the referendum, then the deal that does that, that best protects jobs and our economy, is the deal that is on that the government has put forward. That Everybody will have his or her chance, but the questions have been put and the answers must similarly be heard. The Prime Minister. That is the fundamental question for members of this House, to deliver on and honour the result of the referendum, but to do it in a way that protects jobs and our economy, and that is what this deal does. The Right Honourable Gentleman talks about a number of issues. He, he wants to be in the customs union such that free movement would have to, and the single market and free movement would have to be accepted. He refuses to accept that any deal requires a backstop because that's our commitment to the people of Northern Ireland. He claims he wants to negotiate trade deals, yet wants to be in the customs union, fully in the customs union, that will not enable us to negotiate those trade deals. And finally, he says about the uncertainty, he says about uncertainty for British business. I can tell the right honourable gentleman that the biggest uncertainty for British business lies not in this deal, but on the front bench of the Labour Party. Order. Before I look to the Father of the House and then other colleagues, I want to say the following. Although the Government's intention to halt this debate at this inordinately late stage has been widely leaked to the media in advance, I felt it only appropriate to hear what is proposed before advising the House. Halting the debate after no fewer than 164 colleagues have taken the trouble to contribute, will be thought by many members of this House to be deeply discourteous. Indeed, in the hours since news of this intention emerged, many colleagues from across the House have registered that view to me in the most forceful terms. Having taken the best procedural advice, colleagues should be informed that there are two ways of doing this. The first, and in democratic terms, the infinitely preferable way, is for a minister to move at the outset of the debate that the debate be adjourned. This will give the House the opportunity to express its view in a vote whether or not it wishes the debate to be brought to a premature and inconclusive end. I can reassure ministers that I would be happy to accept such a motion so that the House can decide. The alternative is for the government unilaterally to decline to move today's business, which means that the House is not only deprived of its opportunity to vote upon the substance of the debate tomorrow, but also that it is given no chance to express its view today on whether the debate should or should not be allowed to continue. I politely suggest that in any courteous, respectful and mature environment, allowing the House to have a say, its say, on this matter would be the right and, dare I say it, the obvious course to take. Let us see if those who have assured this House and the public 
over and over and over again that this supremely important vote is going to take place tomorrow without fail, wish to rise to the occasion. Mr Kenneth Clark. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, on, the, on the question of Europe, this House is not uh, just divided into parties, it's divided into factions. And it becomes clear that at the moment there is no predictable majority for any single course of action going forward. Uh, so, uh, would my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, agree that no other governments are going to start negotiations with us on any new arrangement, whilst the British continue to explore what exactly it is they can get a parliamentary majority to agree to? <laughs> Furthermore, we are strictly bound, quite rightly, to the Good Friday Agreement and the issue of a permanently open border in Ireland. So does she agree that it's particularly folly for a large faction in this House to continue for an argument, to, to, an argument that we should insist to the other governments that the British will have a unilateral right to declare an end to that open border at a time of their choosing, which is why the backstop remains inevitable. Yeah. Oh, can I say to my right honourable and learned friend that I certainly agree. I think none of the alternative arrangements that have been floated uh, and su suggested in this House actually would command a majority of this House. But he's also right that we retain our absolute commitment to the Belfast Good Friday Agreement and to uh, the commitments with it that the United Kingdom government made within uh, that agreement. And any agreement which had to be, was being negotiated with the European Union, be that either of the other two options that are normally quoted, the Norway option of some form or the Canada option of some form, would require negotiation, could risk the possibility of there being a period of time uh, when that relationship was not in place and therefore would indeed require a backstop. Yeah, yeah. Kirsty Blackman. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to thank the Prime Minister for advance sight of the statement and thank you, Mr Speaker, for the benefit of your words in relation to how this could proceed. Um, the events of the past few hours have highlighted that this is a government in a total state of collapse. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The Prime Minister has been forced to pull tomorrow's vote in a stunning display of pathetic cowardice. Yeah. 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 The vote tomorrow night would have shown the will of this House, but this government is focused on saving the Prime Minister's job and her party, yeah. instead yeah, yeah. of doing what is right for these countries. Here, here. She is abdicating her responsibility. Her deal will make people poorer. Yep. It will lead to years of further uncertainty and difficult negotiation, here, here. with no guarantee that a trade deal can even be struck. Here, here. It does not have the support of her backbenches. Indeed, no support from the majority of benches across this place. No support from the Scottish Parliament and no support from the Welsh Assembly. Here, here. Why has it taken the Prime Minister this long mm. to face up to reality? Yeah. Her deal was dead in the water long before this morning. Here, here. Last week, it was this deal or no deal. She now needs to be clear with this House about what has changed. Mr Speaker, Scotland voted overwhelmingly to remain in the EU, yeah. but yet again our views are being ignored, yeah. as they have been throughout so this right. disastrous so and incompetent right. Brexit process. Back in 2014, Scotland was promised the strength and security of the UK, but the reality has been Westminster collapse and chaos. Here, here. We were promised an equal partnership, but we've been treated with contempt. Yep. Yeah. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister has lost the confidence of her own benches, and she has failed to convince this House of her plan for exiting the EU. We simply cannot go on like this. It's clear that the Prime Minister is incapable of taking decisions about the future, and that Downing Street cannot negotiate anymore, either with the EU or with the Tory backbenches. What she is really scared of is allowing this House to determine the way forward, and allowing the public the opportunity to remain in the EU. She knows she's lost, but she's still wasting precious time. Mr Speaker, we need the Prime Minister to be clear about when the House will vote on this deal. This government and the Prime Minister have failed. It's time they got out of the way. Prime Minister, members across this House don't want your deal. The EU don't want to renegotiate. Isn't the only way to break this deadlock to put it to the people? Yeah. The, uh, the, hon the Honourable Lady asked uh, 
what, uh, what I have been doing. Actually, what I have been doing is listening to members of this House who have identified a very specific concern with the deal, as it, uh, with the deal that was negotiated. As I said, we had negotiated within that deal a number of uh, aspects to address the issue around the permanence or otherwise of the backstop. Uh, those I give sufficient confidence to members of this House. It has proved in discussions that they have not, and therefore we are going to uh, work to get those further reassurances that I want to get, that I want to ensure with the with other members of the House. The, if the Shadow Foreign Secretary would just have a little patience. The date of the vote was one of the questions that was asked by the Scottish Nationalist Party, and I'm going to come to address that matter. The responsibility, the responsibility of this Government is to deliver on the result of the referendum and do so in a way that is good for the whole of the United Kingdom, and that is what this deal does. I will be going, I will be going, we are deferring the vote and I will be going to seek those assurances. Obviously, obviously, uh, it, there is two parties in relation to this, the United Kingdom and the EU, so we will be holding those discussions. Members will know that there is in legislation, there is uh, the issue of the 21st of January date, which is in legislation in this. The Shadow Foreign Secretary shouts 21st of January as if it's the first time she's heard of it. I suspect. She, I, I suspect, I suspect she actually voted for it when it went through this House, but there we are. I, I don't, but the, 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 the key point of the Honourable Lady's remarks was that this should go back to another vote of the public. I, I have said, and she will not have me, hear me say anything different from what I have said previously, I believe it is important, it is important to honour the result of the referendum. I believe it is a matter of, I believe it is a matter of the duty of members of this House to honour that referendum result, and I believe also it is a matter of faith in politicians that those many people, those, those many people who, the, for the first time ever, or for many decades, went out and voted for uh, leaving the European Union, that they are able to have the confidence that the politicians in this House delivered for them. Mr Ian Duncan Smith. Mr Speaker, I'd like to uh, focus my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, on the issue of the backstop, as this is critical to whatever uh, my right honourable friend conducts with the European Union. Does she not agree with me that now that she has essentially suspended the remaining part of this debate, that it is incumbent on her and the government to go forward boldly to the EU and remind them that they have already said that no matter what, no matter what arrangements would be in place, there would be no hard border on the border of Ireland, and so have the Irish. So given that, would she now commit to going back to them to say they need to reopen the withdrawal agreement and insert into the withdrawal agreement a commitment to open borders and take out those restrictions that would take away the power and control from this parliament to decide its future? Well, can I say to my right honourable friend, I mean, two things. He's right that the European Union have been clear, as we have, about ensuring there's no hard border between Northern Ireland and Ireland. Actually, the European Union have also been clear, as they are in the withdrawal agreement, about the temporary nature of the, uh, the, temporary nature of the backstop. So I think he's right. We should go boldly back to the European Union on these, uh, on these issues. We have been rigorously and robustly, we have been rigorously and robustly debating with them on this and achieved a number of changes to the withdrawal agreement in order to ensure that there could be that reassurance of the temporary nature of the backstop. Uh, but it is now for uh, me and for this government to go back to Europe and to make the point that those, reass those assurances have not been sufficient for members of this House. Nothing should be off the table, but everybody should be very clear that there are, uh, in calling for a reopening of the withdrawal agreement, that there are issues that would then be put back on the table, including the Northern Ireland only customs territory. Sir Vincent Cable. The fiasco has really lost all authority. Yeah. Yeah. And let me just say that I and my colleague support the leader of the opposition. If he now proceeds to confidence vote as duty surely calls. But specifically on the state. 
how many of the heads of government that she telephoned over the weekend have indicated that they would consider the Irish backstop dispensable? The discussions we've consistently had, and have, as I have indicated in my references to other arrangements, are that there should be a backstop to ensure that uh, there is no hard border between Northern Ireland and Ireland. The issue that the concern that has been raised predominantly by colleagues, is the issue, question of the permanence or otherwise of that backstop to ensure that it can be brought to an end, to ensure that it will not continue indefinitely. Uh, I will be getting back to, and I've uh, uh, spoken, the number of European leaders I've spoken to, discussions to find a way to provide reassurance to members of this House on that point. Sir William. Yes. Mr Speaker. Um, the, the Prime Minister knows that the withdrawal agreement and the political declaration are both cover many, many legal issues beyond the backstop, important and vital as that is. Uh, these include, for example, the European Court, control over our own laws, questions relating to compatibility with the Withdrawal Act of 2018. There is an absolute obligation to consult the Attorney General formally and in good time before committing to critical decisions which involve legal considerations. The Government, under the order of the House, I think it's of the 4th of December, must publish his advice in full, both the and the framework. We have seen that so far the only advice that's been published is with regard to the Northern Ireland Protocol. Did the, did the Prime Minister seek the Attorney General's advice under the Code on both these matters in good time or not? And if she did seek his advice, why has that advice not been published? Hi, uh, to my honourable friend, he has been asking me variations of this question in, I think, each of the statements that I've done recently. And uh, I am very clear that the government, the government undertakes its responsibilities in relation to the seeking of legal advice entirely, properly and appropriately. And, of course, the government published a full legal position on the withdrawal agreement, a position uh, in more detail than I think uh, governments have previously published on any, uh, such, uh, on any such occasion or in any similar event. Uh, and not only that, but the Attorney General, of course, came to this House, made a statement and took many questions from members on these issues. Mr. Nigel Dobbs. Speaker. Um, frankly, what the Prime Minister says today simply isn't credible, is it? I mean, this, this, this is an impossible position for the government to find itself in. The Prime Minister says she's listening, but she talks about reassurances and assurances. Does she not get it by now that the withdrawal agreement, legally binding text, is unacceptable to this House? And she cannot pretend going on defending the deal when she knows that if the vote had taken tomorrow, it would have been overwhelmingly defeated. So please, Prime Minister, really do start listening and come back with changes to the withdrawal agreement, or it will be voted down. What can I say to the right honourable gentleman? that the, the purpose of the announcement today that we will defer the vote and return to this matter is precisely to be able to go and discuss with other European leaders, with the Council and the Commission, uh, those further reassurances that are required by this House in relation to the issue that members of this House are concerned about, notably whether or not the backstop, should it ever be used, can be brought to an end, and that is exactly what we will be doing. Dame Caroline Spellman. I should encourage my right on friend to ignore the mockery of the opposition. I'd always prefer a Prime Minister who will listen. Has she also heard our West Midlands manufacturers' concern yeah, yeah, that yeah. leaving with no deal would cause unnecessary exactly. economic damage? And the best way to avoid this is to leave with a deal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, can I say to my right honourable friend, we did indeed listen to manufacturers in the West Midlands and up and down the country uh, as we were putting this uh, deal together, and that has underpinned that desire to protect people's jobs and livelihoods while respecting and delivering on the result of the referendum has underpinned the deal that we have, and the deal that does, this deal does exactly that. Mr Hilary Benn. 
Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Speaker. The Prime Minister challenged others to be upfront about what they want, but she needs to be upfront too. That it was her red lines that created the problem of the border in Northern Ireland that led to the backstop that has brought her to the House of Commons today in such a weak yep. position. Yeah, 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 yeah. Given the answer she gave a moment ago, can she tell the House whether a single of the EU leaders that she spoke to over the weekend indicated that they were prepared to renegotiate Article 20 of the Backstop Protocol? Because in the absence of any such commitment, isn't cancelling tomorrow's vote merely postponing the inevitable? Yeah. Yeah. Can I say to the right honourable gentleman, that the issue that we were very clear on with the European Union in relation to the Northern Ireland border was that there could not be a customs border down the Irish Sea. From in February, their proposals were that exactly that should happen. In, by October, we had persuaded them to enable a UK-wide customs territory to be in the protocol, rather than a Northern Ireland-wide customs territory. That was the key issue in relation to the border that we had set as something that was unacceptable to the United Kingdom, and we negotiated that out of the proposal. Dominic Grieve. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I entirely share my right honourable friend's concern about the maintenance of the Belfast Agreement, the peace process in Northern Ireland, and an open border. But is not the reality of what has happened that this Brexit that is being negotiated highlights with total starkness that far from recovering sovereignty has been proclaimed, we are in fact about to part with it, replacing a bilateral agreement with the Irish government, sustained by referendums on both sides of the border, with an arrangement on which no one has been consulted and ruthlessly undermines our sovereign rights. In those circumstances, and mindful of the fact that my right honourable friend faces many difficulties here which are not of her making, surely we should go back to the public and ask them if that is what they want and offer them the alternative of remaining in the EU. I say to my right honourable and learned friend, this question, I think every member of this House who has raised this issue of going back to the public on this matter needs to consider very carefully the impact that that would have. I believe, I believe it would, I believe it would lead to a significant loss of faith in our democracy. I believe it would lead, it would lead many people, many people to question the role of this House and the role of members within this House. We gave people the decision. The people decided we should deliver on it. Yvette Cooper. Nothing has changed in the level of parliamentary concern about her deal since last week. But the Prime Minister has still sent her ministers out this morning, her official spokesperson out at 11 this morning, to say this vote was 100% going ahead. And yet we still, even now, don't even know when she wants to bring this vote back right. or even what she wants the deal to be. Does she not realise how chaotic and ridiculous yep. this makes yeah. our country look? Yeah. And given the importance of trust and credibility in this entire process, how can she possibly talk about duty and honour yep. and yeah. faith in politicians when we cannot Absolutely. even trust the most basic things her ministers are saying? Yeah. No, I should be clear with the Right Honourable Lady and with the House that I consulted the Cabinet uh, late morning about the decision to defer the, to defer the vote. Uh, that decision was taken because of an understanding of a concern that members of this House have expressed in relation to the backstop, having discussed with members of the House whether the reassurances that had previously been negotiated by the UK Government were sufficient to allay those concerns. It is that issue that we will be going back to the, uh, going back to the European Union on, and it is that issue on which we will be seeking those further reassurances. But I say once again, this House has a responsibility and there will come a point where it will be up to every member of this house to determine whether to determine whether they are going to accept the result of the referendum and deliver a deal for the british people that ensures a smooth exit from brexit and that protects jobs and livelihoods Mr. Damon Green. 
Mr. Speaker. As one of the 164 members you referred to, Mr. Speaker, who have already spoken uh, in this debate, can I assure the Prime Minister that I think it's more important that we end up with the right deal for this country. And what's most important for Parliament is that Parliament is seen to take its responsibility and, if possible, agree a deal. Given that, as she rightly identifies, the Irish backstop has been the one element that has discouraged very many people from across the House from supporting this deal, can she give the House uh, some update from her conversations with European leaders over the last few days as to whether progress is possible on that and therefore uh, can she give us some uh, assurance that Parliament will be able to fulfil its responsibilities and agree a deal? Well, can I uh, thank my right honourable friend for his comment and of course all those members who have already spoken in the debate, their contributions have continue to be an important contribution to, this, uh, to the debate on this subject. Uh, and I can give my right honourable friend the assurance that, having spoken to European leaders, they are open to uh, discussions with us on this particular issue. And I am confident that we will be able to see some further changes. Of course, that will be the matter for further negotiations. Mr Dennis Skinner. Does the Prime Minister realise that she's handed over power, not to people in this house, but she's handed over power to the people that she's going to negotiate with over there in Europe. She looks very weak, and she is. The power that they want is to be able to demonstrate to every other country that might be thinking about getting out of the EU this is handed over their, them the power to be able to demonstrate that that's what Britain is doing. The British Prime Minister now doesn't know whether she's on this earth or fullers because of the action she's taken. Mrs Thatcher had a word for it. What she's done today, F-R-I-T, she's frit. <laughs> And, uh, and I have, and I have every, and I have every confidence that if I had not listened to members of this house, the honourable gentleman would have stood up and said that I was incapable of listening to members of this house and complained about that. Davis. Control of the timing of the backstop by the European Union hands enormous amounts of negotiating power to the other side in this negotiation. Without change, it jeopardises the control of our money, our borders, our regulatory independence and, yes, our constitution too. So it must be time limited under our control and that must be legally enforceable. Is that what she is seeking? Um, I, can I say to my uh, right honourable friend that the issue of the length of time that the backstop could or should be in place if it is ever used, and once again it is the intention of neither side that it be used, uh, is a matter which is already addressed in the withdrawal agreement. What is in, but people are here are concerned at the extent to which they can trust that, uh, those assurances within the withdrawal agreement, and that is why it is, it is important to go back and to uh, get those further reassurances. Caroline Lucas. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister has changed her mind about the vote and she's changed her mind about whether or not the backstop can be amended. So if yep. she can change her mind, why uh. won't she just check whether the British people have changed their minds yeah. since they yeah. voted two years ago? Yeah. Can, I say to the, can I say to the Honourable Lady, does she honestly think that if we were to have a further referendum and it came out with a different result, People wouldn't then say we should have a third referendum to find out exactly what the result was. This is, this is, this is not. And, and I say to the honourable lady, I also wonder whether, if we had a second referendum and it came out with the same result, she would still be asking for a third referendum about this. We gave this Parliament gave people the choice. The people decided. They voted we should deliver on it. Yeah. Dame 
Cheryl Gillan. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mr. Speaker, far from being frit, I think this Prime Minister has great courage yeah. in, coming yeah. Back, yeah. in coming back to face this House, delay the vote in efforts to get the best possible deal yeah. for this country. Yeah. And quite frankly, people that voted in the referendum did so sometimes for the first time. And they decided to accept the result, no matter on which side they voted. Yeah. Surely we should not be letting them down, because they will see little point in exercising their vote again if the result is not honoured and we call a second yeah. referendum. Yeah. Yeah. Can I say to, to my right honourable friend, I think she is absolutely right. I think those people, many of whom voted for the first time at all or for the first time in decades when they voted, uh, in the uh, referendum in 2016, will indeed question that, you know, what, what, why should we vote in future if this Parliament does not deliver on that vote? And as my right honourable friend says, people across the country, whether they voted Leave or Remain, are saying this was the result. Let's just get on with it. Let's deliver it. So Leslie. In the light of this morning's European Court judgment pursued by uh, the Honourable Members for Edinburgh South West, Carl Scholz and Walsingham, and myself, which clarified that all options are available for our country, can I uh, make the Prime Minister a sincere offer in the hope that she will at least keep her options open? If she takes her Brexit proposal back to the British public for a final say, and also allows the public the chance to stay in the European Union, she can be assured of significant support from many on these benches. Here, 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 here. I say, I, I, appreciate, I appreciate the sincerity with which the Right Honourable Gentleman has made, put his question and made his point, um, but I do genuinely feel absolutely that it is important for this House to deliver on the vote that took place in 2016. Prime Minister has just rather generously, but I fear erroneously, elevated the Honourable Gentleman to the Privy Council. But uh, I fear it's probably not a bankable assurance, but you never know. Um, uh, Anna Soubry. Mr Speaker, um, Prime Minister, you will recall how a number of us on these benches urged you indeed begged you to reach out across these benches, across this House and indeed across our country and find a compromise and a consensus before you laid down your red lines and before you began your negotiations. After three days of debating and given the statement of the Commission this lunchtime, it's clear that nothing has changed and nothing will change. But the thing that is changing is the view of the British people. No, it's not. No, it's not. I know it's nearly the pantomime season, but oh yes, it has. And that is why, honourable... Order, I know, order. Uh, the Right Honourable Lady is giving eloquent and full expression to her views, which is not entirely unknown, uh, but the Right Honourable Lady must be heard, and she will be heard. I'm not having any member of this House shouted down. That is not acceptable, and it will not happen. Amen. Anna Subri. That is why, Mr Speaker, <coughs> the Honourable Member for Sunderland and the Honourable Member for Redcar, two of the highest voting leave areas, are now supporting a people's vote, and rightly so, right, because right. their constituents yeah, yeah. are entitled to change their mind, and young people are entitled to have a say about their future, because at the end of the day, they will bear the burden of Brexit. I would urge the Prime Minister, we have found an impasse in this House. It's time now to take this back to the people and have a people's vote. This, uh, the United Kingdom does not have a uh, long tradition of holding referendums. We have held uh, we, the Scottish referendum, there was a referendum back in 1975 on joining the European Economic Community, there was a referendum in 2016 on whether or not to leave the European Union. In all of those votes, the Government has taken a very clear view 
that the result of those referenda should be respected. And I believe this referendum should be respected as well. Savile yeah. Roberts. The people outside these walls see a shambles of a government, and with yeah, this in yeah. mind, we will therefore support the Leader of the Opposition, should he, as he should, table a motion of no confidence. Yeah. Yeah. And as of this morning, European Court of Justice ruling, it's within the Prime Minister's gift, personally, to take no deal off the table. Yeah. Will she today rule out the threat of no deal, and should it prove necessary, be prepared to revoke Article 50. Yeah. Yeah. The result of the European Court of Justice determination is a, a, clearly they've determined it is possible to unilaterally revoke, a, revoke Article 50. But the point that they have made is that nobody should think that revoking Article 50 is a short-term solution or a short-term extension of Article 50. Revoking Article 50 would mean going back on the vote of the referendum and staying in the European Union. Now, Sir Oliver Heald. Uh, when I spoke in the debate, I made it clear that I was supporting the Prime Minister, but I did have concerns about the backstop and its indefinite nature. Does she agree with me that, given that the EU have already recognised that this is a temporary arrangement, given that our Attorney General has already said it would not be forever and there are means of challenging it legally, it would be helpful uh, if our European partners uh, could give more clarity about how long it would take for us to leave uh, leave the, uh, the, the backstop in the event that the talks break down. I think my, my, my uh, right honourable and learned friend is absolutely right. The European Union has already indicated that the backstop is, is uh, temporary in its nature, and therefore I think it's entirely reasonable to ask them to give that further clarification uh, about that temporary aspect of the, uh, of the backstop and the ability to bring the backstop to an end. Oh. In my 27 years in this I've rarely seen a government in such a farrago of chaos as the Prime Minister has caused with her negotiations. Last week, she said, and I quote, I caution honourable members that not only has the EU made it clear that the withdrawal agreement cannot be reopened, we have agreed the deal and the deal is there. She's now abandoned the vote and has come back to this House telling us that somehow the unopenable deal is open again, or she's seeking assurances that it won't be worth the paper they're written on because she's done her legal deal already. Why on earth doesn't she just abandon this dancing on the head of a pin and let us vote on this appalling deal? Uh, the, the, we have negotiated a deal in its two parts with the European Union of the withdrawal agreement and the political declaration on our future relationship. There is one aspect of that withdrawal agreement which has raised particular concerns. That aspect, that aspect of the withdrawal agreement is already uh, dealt with in the withdrawal agreement through various assurances about the temporary nature of the backstop. Those assurances have uh, have, it, in discussions with colleagues, it's clear those assurances are not sufficient, and we therefore go back to seek further uh, reassurance on the nature of that temporary aspect of the backstop. John Redwood. Many pe people think that signing away large sums of money would badly undermine our negotiating position on the Irish backstop and the future partnership. So will she reassert with the House of Lords findings, we do not owe this money and nothing is agreed until everything is agreed? Uh, uh, can I say to my right honourable friend, I know this is a point that he has, uh, he has pressed before, uh, and I recognise that the House of Lords came up out with uh, an opinion in relation to this, uh, but indeed there are other legal opinions in relation to the application of uh, uh, various aspects of international law on the uh, treaty, which says that indeed we do have legal obligations in financial financial terms, and I believe that as a country we should meet those obligations. Joanna Cherry. Yeah. Yeah. Speaker, uh, the Prime Minister has said that she doesn't want a second vote because it risks dividing the country again. But can I remind her that the United Kingdom is not a country, it's a union of four nations. And already, already that union is divided because two out of those four nations voted to remain. Yeah. Yeah. If she can, she's conceded this afternoon that she can't get this House to support her deal. So if she really believes in the deal, why won't she have the courage of her convictions and put that deal to the four nations of the UK 
and give them a choice between her deal or remaining in the European Union, as the Court of Justice has said this morning is possible. Why not put it back to the people, Prime Minister? Yeah. Well, I can, I can recognise why uh, somebody representing the SNP might have a desire to try to change the result of a referendum when it has taken place. Uh, but I would say to the Honourable Lady, I would say to the Honourable Lady that I have answered the question in relation to going back to the people on a number of occasions this afternoon and on other occasions. I have, I have not been lax in coming to this House and standing up in this chamber and answering questions on this matter. Uh, and can I also just point out to the Honourable Lady, we entered the European Economic Community as one United Kingdom and we will be leaving as one United Kingdom. Sir Patrick McLaughlin. Can I say to my right honourable friend, I think leaving without a deal will be lease the manufacturing businesses across the Midlands. Can she confirm that the only way that happens is if people refuse the deal which is on offer? We do leave on the 29th of March. Yeah. Uh, so. Right honourable friend is absolutely right. The only way to ensure that there is no deal is to have a deal. Uh, and the deal on the table is a good deal for the UK, and we will be leaving on the 29th of March next year. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister has said that she's going back for more reassurances on the backstop. Does she accept that those reassurances, no matter how strong, will not be legal? And would she not think that she would be better able to negotiate if the EU knew that this House had overwhelmingly voted against the deal? Yeah. I think the fact that uh, I have indicated that it is necessary to go back uh, has sent a clear message to the European Union about the importance of engaging on this particular, of engaging on this particular issue and ensuring that there are the level of assurance that is required by members of this House that, that, that is sufficient for members of this House to believe that they can have the confidence that the backstop is not indefinite. It's that indefinite, potential indefinite nature of the backstop, should it come into place, that has been raising concerns about members, for all members of this House, and I believe it is that that we should be addressing particularly. Ben Patterson. <laughs> On the 7th of March, President Tusk offered the UK a wide-ranging free trade agreement which founded on the issue of the Northern Ireland border. It's therefore exasperating, Mr Speaker, today that the Prime Minister is still talking about the backstop as the only solution to this border. She's heard from the right honourable member for Belfast North. This is a breach of the Belfast Agreement Principle Consent. It's even a breach of the Articles of the Act of Union 1801. Since then, she has met international customs experts. She's met a Nobel Prize winner, right on Lord Trimble. She knows that existing techniques and existing custom procedures can continue to deliver a seamless border. Will she please, at this late stage, put the backstock and all its horrors behind her, go back to the European Union and take up the offer made by President Tusk using these modern, seamless customs techniques. Yeah. Can I perhaps just say to my right honourable friend that the offer that the European Union put to the United Kingdom was for a Canada-style free trade agreement for Great Britain, uh, because, they, uh, because in order to deal with the seamless border between Northern Ireland and Ireland, they wanted to separate Northern Ireland away from the customs territory of uh, Great Britain, and therefore not have a single UK customs territory. And in relation to the technical issues, that the uh, technical solutions that my right honourable friend refers to, yes, indeed, and we have continued to engage with those who put these forward. The question is not just about no physical infrastructure on the border. The question is about the extent to which people on both sides of the border are able to continue to lead their lives as they do today with no increased barriers or, or uh, encumbrances to their leading their lives in that way. And that is what I believe delivers on the seamless border, which does indeed underpin the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. And ben Bradshaw. She, she said in her statement uh, that this is the best deal and the only deal, and it is time for all of us in this place to face up to our responsibilities. We're ready to do that, Prime Minister, so put this deal to a vote in this House, and if she's not prepared to that, put it to a vote of the people. Yeah. Yeah, that uh, we are deferring the vote. We will seek these further. 
we will seek, we will seek these further reassurances. Uh, and on the issue of the vote to the people, the right honourable gentleman has heard my answer to that question uh, uh, several times already this afternoon. And Dr. Julian Lewis. Date of 29th of March won't be put off as well. I say we have actually put it into legislation, and this this government is committed to delivering exiting on the 29th of March. <laughs> Emma Reynolds. To be clear that she is seeking an exchange of letters of reassurance with the EU, not a change to the text of the withdrawal agreement. Mm -hmm. Just that. I, uh, I have said earlier that nothing's off the table. That what we're looking at, actually, there are a range of ways in which I believe we can find the assurances uh, for members of this House. My, the task is to find sufficient reassurance that gives the confidence to members of this House that the backstop will not be indefinite. Andrew Bridgen. Successful renegotiations require trust and credibility. Given the Prime Minister's breathtaking U-turn today, Robbie. I put it to her that she has lost the trust and credibility of the House, Robbie. lost the trust Robbie. and credibility Robbie. of the country, and most importantly, she has lost the trust and credibility of the European Union. I have to say to my honourable friend, no, that was uh, what was very clear in my discussions with European leaders, is that they, we will be able to have discussions with them, myself and the UK Government, on this issue. Liz Kendall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Prime Minister told MPs to be honest about the options we face, but she has never spelt out to her backbenchers or the public that any type of Brexit deal has always been a choice between damaging our economy and having a hard border in Northern Ireland or ending up as a rule taker. Really? Isn't it this failure that's led to this crisis Absolutely. and she only has herself to blame? Yeah. Uh, no, I say to the, the Honourable Lady, we have been clear about the need for this, what we believe is right for the United Kingdom, which is to negotiate a bespoke deal, which does not I mean, either the sort of Norway EEA option, uh, which is at one end of the spectrum that the European Union offered in the first place, or the Canada-style deal for Great Britain uh, with Northern Ireland carved out in a separate customs territory, which is at the other end of the spectrum the EU proposed. And the political declaration does indeed include a trade agreement with a free trade area at its heart, with no tariffs, no quantitative of restrictions and with ambitious proposals in relation to the customs border. Mrs. Theresa Villiers. We will be well aware that the backstop was just one of a number of very grave concerns backbenchers have about the draft withdrawal agreement. So, can she assure the House that she will seek to reduce, for example, the role of the European Court of Justice and change the text of the withdrawal agreement accordingly? <laughs> Perhaps I, I hope I can give some further reassurance to my right honourable friend. Because in discussions with a number of colleagues, there seems to be um, a misunderstanding about the role of the European Court of Justice. What we will have in our future relationship is we will end the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice. The European Court of Justice will not be the final arbiter of the withdrawal agreement. There has been, I think, some misunderstanding of the reference in the withdrawal agreement to the point that the, Euro the arbitration panel that is dealing with disputes will be able to ask the European Court of Justice for its opinion on its interpretation of EU law, but the dispute would be determined by the arbitration panel and not by the European Court of Justice. Mr. Barry Shearman. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister may not know, but I've been in this House nearly 40 years, and if I'd made my speech later today, I would have told her that my duty, my sacred duty as a Member of Parliament, is to come here and look after the health, welfare and future prosperity of my constituents, overriding everything else. I have been sympathetic to the situation she finds herself in, but I have lost that sympathy because what I understand now from today's decision is that she is actually being captured by the far right, far, far right Brexit wing of her party, the European so-called European Research Group that doesn't believe in research. They, she is a captive of this unpleasant nationalist populist group in the Conservative Party. No, the concern about the uh, potential indefinite nature of the backstop is one that has been expressed by a wide range of members of Parliament, including some on the opposition benches. Uh, Sir Oliver Letwin. 
Uh, I very much hope, for the sake of this country, that the Prime Minister will prevail in the difficult negotiations that lie ahead. Yeah. But I hope that as she enters those negotiations, she will be sustained by the widespread admiration, not just on these benches, not just amongst Conservatives, but in the country as a whole, for the dignity and the perseverance yeah. she has shown. I think, uh, I think my best answer to my right hon. Friend is to say thank you, and I will be. <laughs> Yes, Phillips. <laughs> Yay! Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Getting worried for my knees, Mr. Speaker. Um, I want to ask the Prime Minister if she thinks that going back and changing minutia about the backstop is actually going to make any difference to the kind of people on her side. Exactly who like to go around calling themselves Aslan and <laughs> circling around her head, caring nothing about this country, yeah, but yeah, only yeah. about their own position. Exactly. This backstop rejig can kicking is going to make absolutely no difference to those people and they know it. So what's the plan then? Yeah. I say to the, the honourable lady, the issue of the potential indefinite, what people are concerned about is the potential indefinite nature of the backstop. There is no intention for that to be indefinite. There is no intention for it to be used in the first place. That is a genuine concern that is held by people across this House, and I think entirely right that the government addresses it. And Dr. Sarah Wollaston. Um, the Prime Minister rightly talks about listening to young people and first-time voters. Would she accept that they voted overwhelmingly to remain? And they look at what's happening in this House and they see that this deal is Brexit, warts and all. This is as good as it gets. And isn't it time, now that we know what Brexit actually looks like, as opposed to some fantasy version of Brexit, that those people get the chance to actually vote on Brexit reality rather than Brexit fantasy? I, say, I, I think my honourable friend has heard my response in relation to uh, a people's vote, a second referendum, uh, it, and before. I genuinely believe that we should recognise that the referendum in 2016 was the biggest exercise in democracy in our history. And we should respect those many people who went out to vote, including many who had not voted before. And I believe that if we then go back to people and say, have another think, think again, actually, they will question the value of that democracy and the value of the vote. I'm quite happy to Lucy Powell. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Um, this is a political challenge for the Prime Minister, not a substantive uh, one. And it seems that the Prime Minister's strategy is now to try and placate further the ERG wing of her own party. But isn't the truth that they are insatiable? They will not ever be satisfied. So given that the parliamentary maths of this are now so difficult to really break this deadlock, I believe, requires different parliamentary maths and a general election. Yeah. Uh, can I say to the Honourable Lady uh, that I think what this country requires is us to continue to work to get a good deal over the line so we can deliver on Brexit, deliver it in a way that honours the referendum, protects jobs and livelihoods across this country. Further uncertainty and division in this country will do nothing to help people who are looking to their futures. Sir Desmond Swain. Essential to any successful negotiator is the ability to walk away. The backstop takes that from us. How can she change that? I say to the, my right honourable friend that we are continuing, first of all, that we are continuing on the no deal preparations, and the Cabinet, as I said earlier, will be meeting to uh, discuss those further. Secondly, that in any circumstance, we need to ensure that there is no hard border between Northern Ireland and Ireland. It's finding the ways that we can do that in a way that does indeed enable us to be free in a future relationship, which is uh, the, the best possible deal for this country that we are looking for and uh, striving to achieve. Stephen Doughty. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
the Prime Minister talks about faith in democracy, but I think a lot of people, whether they voted leave or remain, looking at this shambles today, will see a Prime Minister who's tried to keep economic advice from this House and from the public, has tried to keep legal advice from this House and the public, and a government that's been found in contempt. She's trying to prevent us having a vote on her own deal, and she's trying to prevent us having a vote on whether or not she should be able to have a vote on that deal or not. <laughs> People are going to be looking at this aghast, and I've spoken to many Leave voters in my constituency. I deeply respect and understand the reasons why they voted Leave in 2016, but many of them have changed their mind. And they're looking at this, they're saying to me that they want a chance to have a say on what is before them, Brexit reality, not Brexit fantasy, and that is why we need a people's vote. I say to the Honourable Gentleman, uh, he is wrong, of course, in, because we did provide economic analysis for this House. We published economic analysis, we published the uh, legal position in relation to the withdrawal agreement and the political declaration that has been available for members of this House. And he talks about the vote as if, uh, as if the, 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 there is no vote in the future. Of course, we, will be, we are deferring the vote while we have these further discussions with the EU. Mrs Anne Main. Very much, Mr. Speaker. The Prime Minister cannot fail to notice that there are plenty of challenges, legal challenges, surrounding Brexit, whether or not it was the fact that the referendum was legally binding, whether or not we could take Article 50 off the table. So uh, my concern is that any reassurances or assurances given will only be subject to legal challenges down the road if they are not legally binding. Therefore, assurances and reassurances will not make a difference to how I feel about the flaws in this particular right, withdrawal. Right. No, can I say to the Honourable Lady, I, I entirely recognise the point that she uh, is making about uh, legal position in relation to any assurances that are achieved. Obviously, we are at the beginning of the discussions with the European Union on this matter, but what I want to ensure is that members like my honourable friend are able to have the confidence in those assurances when they come back from the European Union. Mr David Lammy. There is, no one, there is no one currently in the House who has been Prime Minister. Does she appreciate that other Prime Ministers under pressure did not delay their legislation? Margaret Thatcher didn't delay after poll tax. Tony Blair didn't delay the Iraq war decision. John Major didn't delay Maastricht. Prime Minister, Prime Minister, she knows, she knows that when the politics of this place is broken, you either resign, you go back to the people in a general election or a referendum. No one gets to play for extra time before the game is over. I say to the right honourable gentleman that the whole premise of his question, I think, was wrong. And I think if he looks back in the history of this uh, of governments in this country, he will see that. Greg Hands. The Prime Minister, in her statement, said that the government will step up its work in preparation for a possible No Deal outcome, and this is very important. Uh, she said the same uh, last month. So I'm wondering if my right honourable friend could tell us at least one action that is now taking place that wasn't taking place last month. Yes, I'm, I'm very happy to say to my right honourable friend, we have indeed been stepping up the uh, action that's been taken. So since uh, I said that, HMRC has taken action in writing out to over 140,000 businesses. And uh, indeed, the Department for Health and Social Care has uh, written out to pharmaceutical companies, for example, on the potential impact on no deal on medicines and devices. Pat McFadden. Speaker, the Prime Minister has come to the House to talk to us about honesty on the day when she's trying to pull a vote, which she said would not be pulled, in order to try to change a deal she said could not be changed. Isn't it time to be honest about the commitments this country has made to no hard border, to the Good Friday Agreement, and to not doing huge damage to our economy, and the fact that any deal any deal. She can talk to the European Union about the backstop all day, but any deal that respects those commitments will require us to sign up to a set of common European rules exactly. over which we will no longer have any say by dint of the fact of Brexit. So isn't it time to be honest both with her backbenchers and with the public about this, instead of trying to square unsquareable circles or even worse, 
hide the facts of this fundamental choice until after we're out. Yeah. Uh, we are committed to no hard border between Northern Ireland and Ireland. We are committed to the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. We are committed to a deal which actually delivers on the protection of people's jobs and livelihoods. That is the deal that we have negotiated. The Right Honourable Gentleman refers to the issue of how one can operate on a trading basis with the European Union in relation to rules that the European Union set. Of course, what the Government set out was a proposal, and this is reflected in the balance identified in the political declaration, that if you want to restrict, or if you want to reduce, if you want to uh, remove customs checks, then it is necessary to make commitments in relation to the obligations that you are willing to sign up to. Uh, what we proposed in the uh, proposal the Government put forward in the summer was to do just that, but to ensure that Parliament had a lock on those votes. But of course, there would be a consequence, and we were honest that there would be a consequence if Parliament chose not to accept those rules. That is being open with people about the consequences of their decisions. Justine Greening. Mm. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister has yet, not yet confirmed when the meaningful vote will actually be held. Uh, my understanding from the House Commons Library is that now the Government has made a statement, as she has today, that the political agreement on the, with, the, political agreement on the withdrawal, withdrawal agreement and future framework has been reached. The, the requirements now for the Government to make a statement to the House by the 21st of January on no deal has been superseded because of her statement being made today. And in their view, then, in practice, the latest date we could have a meaningful vote would then be the 28th of March. Can I ask her whether this is what she intends and get some assurances yep. that the delay she's talking about is a matter of days, not weeks and months? Yeah. 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 Can I say to uh, my honourable friend? Uh, that I do not believe the scenario that she has set out is the, uh, is the correct one. Um, there is the 21st of January date, of course, has been set in legislation. There was a vote which referred to that uh, earlier, which took uh, place last week. Um, so we are conscious of the requirements that that places on the, uh, on the government. But I believe it is right that we should be uh, recognising concerns that have been expressed, uh, expressed in this House and attempting to find a way through those concerns and to resolve those concerns. Seema Malhotra. Yeah, yeah. Mr Speaker, could the Prime Minister confirm reports that over £100,000 has been shelled out by the government on Facebook ads in the last week, promoting the Prime Minister's yeah. deal that yeah. even she is not now happy with? Yeah. Oh, isn't this now an even bigger Wait. farce that with yeah. uncertainty around UK business access to EU trade arrangements and many other issues, that she seeks to sideline Parliament once again, make social, com social media companies richer, while the country pays the price. Yeah. Yeah. Prime Minister! Yeah. The Honourable Lady, no. Uh, the, the, uh, what we have done is recognise that there is a specific aspect of the deal which is raising concerns here in this House. Uh, we will seek re reassurances in relation to that specific aspect of the deal. I continue to believe that overall this deal is the right deal for the United Kingdom. Connor Burns. The Prime Minister has been consistent since she assumed the Premiership that a bad deal will be worse than no deal. And we have had the time since June 2016 to do the preparations for us leaving on WTO terms. Yet front bench ministers consistently refer to the eventuality of leaving without her deal as chaos. Are our preparations really so woeful? Yes. Yes. Can I say to my minister? We have indeed been making those preparations and we continue to make those preparations and, as I indicated earlier, have been stepping up those preparations. But in relation to the impact of no deal, uh, can I say to my honourable friend, it isn't just a question of what we do in the United Kingdom. Right. What happens at the border depends on others as well as what we, uh, preparations we make in the UK. And we cannot, we cannot determine what action others will take. So there will be a consequence of leaving with no deal, particularly if that is uh, sort of going out without it on a, a sense of ill will between us and the European Union, with no decisions that have helped to mitigate that uh, impact of no deal. So it isn't just about what we do here, it is about what others do as well. Steve McCabe. If the only thing the Prime Minister has heard is that a few 
tweaks to the backstop arrangement will do the trick. Isn't it obvious that once again she's just not listening hard enough? Yeah. Yeah. Prime Minister. As, as I've said earlier, I recognise that the issue that has been raised about the backstop is a genuine concern for many members across this House. That is why I believe it's right that we address it. Yes. Chris Blunt. On Friday, the Treasury confirmed to me that this House has approved £4.2 billion worth of uh, planning for no withdrawal agreement, and that in terms, stability in a no deal scenario partly depends on the EU taking a similar non disruptive approach to planning. Uh, with the economic prosperity of one of its members, the Republic of Ireland, very closely engaged, and with £39 billion at stake, and the interests of all the EU businesses that sell twice as much to us as we sell to them, why on earth would they not be planning with us a non-disruptive move to the certainty of World Trade Organization terms and the certainty of control over our economy and our ability to make future trade arrangements? Prime Minister. The, my, uh... My honourable friend, right honourable friend asks why on earth wouldn't they? The fact is that the European Union has been making some of its own preparations for no deal. It has sent certain notices out in relation to certain matters, uh, but the, uh, it has not been engaging with us on the uh, aspect of determining or mitigating the impact of no, of, uh, no deal on both sides of the border. Anna Bardell. I ask this on behalf of the many Livingston constituents of mine that have been in touch, and I'm sure many people across the UK. What the heck is going on? This is a complete and utter cluster bura. Why is she more concerned with her own self-preservation and narrow party unity than the lives and livelihoods of my Livingston constituents? How dare she postpone this vote just because she was going to lose? Downing Street and her team have spent the last few days saying the vote was happening. How can anybody in this House, or indeed anybody in the countries of the United Kingdom, ever trust a single word that she or her government speaks ever again? Yeah. Prime Minister. I'll, say to the Honourable Lady, I'll tell the Honourable Lady what's going on. What's going on is this government was working to ensure that this Parliament, will, uh, that we can get over the line through this Parliament, a deal that is good for the whole of the United Kingdom. Well, Mr Peter Bone. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Going back to what you said at the beginning of the statement, we had a very detailed business, business of the House motion passed. It even specified how many hours and on what days and when the vote would be. Ministers were sent out all over the country relating to that debate. Over 100 MPs have spoken already. 140 wanted to speak today. Now, it may well be that the Prime Minister is right that this House would like to put off the vote, but it needs to be this House that decides that. And, Prime Minister, I don't think so far you've answered the question whether the procedure to be used is a motion of adjourning the House, in which case this House would have a vote, or whether it's just going to be by one sort of anonymous whip saying tomorrow. Prime Minister. Honourable friend, that uh, I believe it is important for the government to be listening to the uh, comments that have come to us in relation to this specific issue and to be responding to those comments. If we want to ensure that we get uh, a, a deal over the line that is good for the British people, then I believe that is the, absolutely the responsible approach for this government to take. Mary Cray. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister's negotiating strategy seems to be fail again, fail better, and it is not going to revive her zombie Brexit deal whenever she decides to bring it back to this House. Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, Boxing Day, it will be voted down. She talks of the will of the people, but the will of the people cannot be undermined by a vote of the people. Isn't that now what she must do? The Honourable, the Honourable Lady has heard my response to the question of a, a further vote, uh, a, a second referendum or a people's vote on this issue. And can I, can I just gently remind members of the opposition that every one of them stood on a manifesto commitment to deliver on the referendum? 
Joe Johnson. Uh, thank you, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, the problem with the deal goes far beyond the backstop. May I ask my right honourable friend what she intends to do about the fact that the government's own analysis shows that every region of the country is going to be left poorer, and we're going to end up with less say over the rules governing huge swathes of our economy than we have at the moment. Yeah. 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 Minister. Uh, my honourable friend, that actually what the government's economic analysis shows that in delivering on the referendum, the deal, these, none of the uh, proposals actually, uh, this deal does not make us poorer than we are today. What it does, what it does, no, read it. What the, economic, what the economic analysis shows is that if you want to honour the referendum, then the best deal for doing that and delivering for jobs and the economy is this deal. Mr Gibbon-Jones. I uh, not only respect the result of the referendum, I accept it. Uh, the Prime Minister in her statement said that she wants... So it's five o'clock on another dramatic day in the Commons. You're watching the News Hour live from Westminster. I'm Mark Austin, coming up. Prime Minister. To the Honourable Gentleman, that we have been putting more money into our health service. We are giving, going to give the health service the biggest cash boost, boost in its history and a long term plan that ensures the sustainability of the health service. And in the, eight years, in the eight years that I have been in government, under both the Coalition Government and this Conservative Government, we have seen 3.3 million jobs being created across our country. That's good for his constituents and good for constituents elsewhere. John Whittingdale. Um, my right my friend in her statement said that alternative arrangements making use of technology could be put in place which would render the backstop unnecessary. Will she therefore incorporate those arrangements and go back to the European Union and ask for a free trade agreement along the lines that Michel Barnier proposed and said was the only way which could ensure that her red lines weren't breached and which would deliver on what the British people voted for? Minister. Quite honourable friend, the, the alternative arrangements are indeed specifically referenced in the withdrawal agreement. And of course, what we are looking for, what we have set out in the uh, political declaration and the proposals the government has put forward, is indeed a wide-ranging free trade area. It's just a better one than the one the European Union was proposing to us. Diana Johnson. Mr. Speaker, I spoke in good faith on Thursday, yeah. one of the yeah. 164 yeah, members of Parliament who did. Sure. I cannot understand why the Prime Minister did not hear before that debate started the concerns that members had about the backstop and other issues. So which part of the shambles that we're in today does she most regret? And when will I be able to vote against her deal, as most of my constituents are asking me to do? Prime Minister. To the Honourable Lady, we will indeed, of course, uh, when we have uh, sought the reassurances from the European Union, be bringing the matter back. But I, I, I say to the, also say to the Honourable Lady that I think it was right that we have listened. Uh, in negotiating, we listened to concerns that have been raised by members of this House. That's why we negotiated a number of changes to the withdrawal agreement before it was agreed that recognised the temporary nature of the backstop. Those have proved not to satisfy members of this House, and it is on that basis that I will seek further assurances. Dr. Andrew Murison. The Prime Minister's grit and determination to get the best deal available is truly remarkable. Does she, does she agree with me that in the event that the European Union fails to give anything meaningful in relation to the backstop to a hard border that we all agree is not necessary and will not happen, it will not have demonstrated a scintilla of the good faith that is referenced in the political declaration? Well, my my Minister. office made a very interesting point about the good faith. I believe it is important that both sides move together at this point with that good faith and do negotiate, do recognise, the European Union recognises the need for further reassurance on this matter and does indeed uh, respond to that and respond to that positively. Dame Louise Ellman. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, the Prime Minister told the House this afternoon that this is the very best deal that actually is negotiable with the EU. Those were her very words. Yet she now tells us she plans to go back to Brussels to plead with them to help her and get her out of this hole. This isn't a government in control. Surely we should put this issue back to the people yeah. to ask if they really want to continue with this perilous journey that will make the UK poorer. 
to the honourable lady that we, what uh, we have done, we have a deal. We have a deal agreed with the European Union. There is one aspect of it on which people require further reassurance, and it is that basis we're going back. Mr. Shailesh Barra. Forefront on the international stage in advocating democracy. Indeed, colleagues on both sides of the House have regularly spoken in Parliament of the need for democracy in other countries. And on both sides of the House, again, we regularly instruct MPs and legislators from other countries at seminars held by the CPA and IPU of the importance of listening to the people who they represent. Would my right honourable friend agree with me that to now have a second referendum would ensure that the UK loses all credibility on the international stage in speaking up for democracy? My honourable friend has made a very important point. Uh, we, do, we do speak to others about the importance of democracy. I think it's important that we show an example ourselves and respect the vote that the people took. Tom Bray. Speaker, I'd like to ask the Prime Minister to do three things. First of all, to rule out no deal, because she knows it will be extremely damaging. Secondly, to support a people's vote, if only to save her the embarrassment of when she has to support it in a couple of weeks' time. And finally, to instruct her Chief Whip to make time available for a debate on a no-confidence motion that I know the Leader of the Opposition is going to be tabling. To the right honourable gentleman, he asked me to support a people's vote. The answer to that, he's heard me answer that on a number of occasions. Uh, the government will continue with its No Deal preparations because that is only that is the reasonable and uh, reasonable things for to do. And in terms of time for debates within this house, there are accepted uh, protocols in relation to that. Mr. Robert Halfon. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I respect the efforts um, being made by uh, the Prime Minister, but could I just ask uh, my right and honourable friend that, on top of the 39 billion, if Britain is uh, the transition period is extended uh, for the extra two years, how many extra billions will we be paying per year um, in that extra transition period? And will she give this House a real say in determining how much money? goes to the EU in that trans extra transition period if it happened. Minister. Uh, in answer to my right honourable friend's question, first of all, the terms of that further extension of the transition period, the implementation period, were it to be uh, uh, the way forward, would be, have to be negotiated. Um, the, there would be an expectation on the part of the EU for uh, a sum of money. We would consider that, that would, it was necessary that should be fair and proportionate. Of course, this is one of the differences between the backstop, as it appears, in the withdrawal agreement and the extension of the transition period, in that in the backstop, no financial obligation is required from the United Kingdom. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister says a people's vote would not reflect the will of the people and it would be divisive, but we do not know what the will of the people is in 2018. We are already a divided country. Nothing will divide us more and fuel the far right than a deteriorating economy. And is it not the case that notwithstanding any tweak she makes to her backstop, her deal, her withdrawal agreement will still leave us poorer relative to the current deal we have now. Yeah. 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 Right. Minister. Uh, the vote was, took place in 2016. People voted to leave the European Union. I believe it is our duty to deliver on that. Mr Douglas Ross. Much, Mr. Speaker. I am one of the hundreds of members who was hoping to participate in the debate yeah, yeah. this evening and tomorrow. And I hope, Mr. Speaker, the government have listened very closely to your guidance and allow members the opportunity to explain their views. Because I would like the opportunity to explain to the people in Murray why I came to the conclusion that I could not support the Prime Minister in her deal. But could I ask the Prime Minister particularly a question that has so far been evaded from across the House? Not only do members in this chamber, but our constituents deserve to know when the vote will finally be taken. When will it be? Yeah, yeah. 
I say to my honourable friend, we are going to seek, uh, dis- we are going to discuss with the European Union, with the other partner, with the other party to this negotiation, uh, the requirements that we have and requirements that we are putting uh, putting forward. And of course, until those discussions have properly started, it's not possible to say the length of time that it will be necessary to hold those discussions. Reference has already been made. Reference has already been made to the 21st of January date, which is within the. Uh, within the legislation uh, that this House has passed. Um, I want to work as quickly and as urgently as possible with, well, my honourable friend says when, but the, 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 the question, as I've just said, is we need actually to enter those discussions with the European Union, and until we have done that, until we have done that, it is not possible to give a date. Vera Hobhouse. Mr Speaker, um, an honourable member from this side of the House um, only said last week the government always says no before it says yes. So I'm holding my breath about the people's vote. But, Mr Speaker, I've got another question to the Prime Minister. In 2016, 17.4 million people voted to leave the EU, and the Prime Minister says her deal is delivering Brexit and the will of the people. Those honourable members on her own side, who also want to leave the European Union, like the members for Uxbridge or North East Somerset or Wickham, don't believe that her deal is delivering on Brexit and on the will of the people. How many of the 17.4 million people who voted in 2016 voted for her deal? Prime Minister. I say to the, the honourable lady. Up and, up and down the country, the messages that I get from people, regardless of whether they voted leave or remain, are very simple. Deliver on the vote, get on with it, and let's move on. Giles Watling. Speaker, I, I speak as a Remainer, which is probably a dangerous thing to do in this corner no, of the back no, no, However, I respect the results of the referendum, but I'd like to ask my right honourable friend, um, what has been the point of all the pain and uncertainty of the last two years if in the final analysis the, uh, the arbitration panel still remains under the dominion of the European Court of Justice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can I say to my honourable friend, this is one of what I believe is, is a misunderstanding of the situation. The arbitration panel does not remain under the dominion of the European Court of Justice. The arbitration panel will make its own decisions. But if there is a dispute which involves an aspect or in the interpretation of European Union law, there is only one body that can interpret European Union law, and that is the European Court of Justice. So the arbitration panel will be able to ask the uh, ECJ for their opinion on that particular point, and they, as an arbitration panel, will then determine the dispute. The European Court of Justice will not be the arbiter of that dispute. Sammy Wilson. Speaker. Shortly after the Prime Minister announced that there would be no vote on this issue, Michelle Barnier and the Taoiseach of the Irish Republic were slapped down the idea that there would be any renegotiation of this deal. The Prime Minister may be prepared to be humiliated by arrogant EU officials and by Irish politicians. But does she not realise that every time she comes back here with her tail between her legs, she humiliates the British people? When will she stand up to the EU? And if she is not prepared to stand up to the EU, then let her have the vote of this House to tell them what we think of their rotten deal. Can I say to the honourable gentleman that we have stood up to the European Union? And perhaps one of the very good examples of standing up to the European Union was our absolute refusal as a government to accept a customs border down the Irish Sea and to see the United Kingdom separated into two customs territories. In February, that was what the European Union wanted. They stuck to that until we had argued them out of it in October. We have stood up to the European Union. We have got a good deal for the UK. Richard Drax. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It is the duty and responsibility of every single member in this House to take our country out of the EU. And can I tell my right honourable friend that her deal does not do that? And many MPs on both sides of the House are intentionally thwarting that intention. 
Can I ask my right honourable friend to go back to the EU, offer a free trade agreement, and if that is not acceptable, to fall back on WTO terms and then deal with the EU outside the EU, where I am positive a deal will be struck and this poison and division will be gone. Yeah. Prime Minister. My honourable friend, I agree with my honourable friend that I think every member of this House has a duty to deliver on the result of the referendum and take the United Kingdom out of the European Union. Uh, what we have, what is on the table within this deal, what the government has been working for, is a free trade uh, area, a free trade agreement with the European Union, but just a better one than the basic sort of free trade agreement that has been proposed by the EU in the early stages of the negotiation. Mrs. Helen Goodman. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Prime Minister said in her statement, and I agree with her, that the majority of people in this House do not want no deal. And she also knows that the ERG are a small minority in this House. So rather than writing a side letter which won't satisfy them, why doesn't she do what my right honourable friend said and agree the next step of negotiating objectives across the House? Yeah. Minister. As I have explained to members previously, this question of the backstop and the concern of the backstop is one that is not just held by a small number of members of this House. It is held by a wide range of members and held by members across, the oppos across opposition benches as well as the government benches. And I believe in that circumstance we are taking exactly the right action. Uh, Mr David Trudenic. Will my right honourable friend not bring this back to the House before Christmas to give members with entrenched positions a chance to reflect over the research? I, I hear what my honourable friend says. I think, I think, as I said earlier, I think, as I said earlier, the timing of this uh, is rather better determined by the nature of the discussions that we have with the European Union. Peter Kyle. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Prime Minister started this process by going to the Supreme Court to stop the House of Commons having a say in starting this Brexit in the process. We're only having a vote tomorrow, or were only having a vote tomorrow, because she was defeated last year in the withdrawal amendment. Isn't it true, isn't it true Mr Speaker, that she has the barefaced cheek to come before this House and lecture us about a duty to this House and our Parliament? Isn't it true that no Prime Minister is better than a bad Prime Minister? Can I say to the honourable gentleman, what I, what I have pointed out, what I have pointed out today to members of this House is the duty that each and every one of us has, having stood as he did on a manifesto to deliver on the result of the referendum, to do exactly that. Lee Rowley. Could the Prime Minister give me one example of how a political reassurance in law can ever supersede the binding words in an international treaty? Yeah. 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 Minister. Can I say to my honourable friend that I think he is making an assumption about what will come back from the European Union? And, and it, is, it, is, it is the task of the government, obviously, to look to negotiate uh, something that will be sufficient to give the confidence to members of this House in relation to the backstop not being able to be an indefinite. Luciana Berger. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I've listened very closely to the Prime Minister's responses so far this afternoon, and I ask her, does she truly believe that the people who voted to leave two and a half years ago did so in order to make our country poorer? Uh, and did she, do they do so at any cost? Do they want Brexit at any cost? And if she's so sure that the majority of our country want this actual deal rather than the false promises that they were missold. Why doesn't she do the most democratic thing and take her deal back to the country and give them a final say? Prime Minister. I say to the Honourable Lady that I think what people voted for was to ensure that we uh, put, brought an end to free movement, which the deal does, was to ensure that we brought an end to sending uh, vast annual sums to the European Union, which the deal does, and was to bring to an end the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice, which the deal does. Yeah. 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 James Cleverly. Thank you, Mr. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, colleagues, uh, uh, honourable friends and members across the House have been expressing uh, anecdotal and unscientific uh, assessments of their voters change their mind about the referendum results. And in that spirit, I would like to highlight the conversations I've had with both friends and constituents who voted Remain but are now determined that we leave the European Union in good order. So will she give me an assurance that she will go back to the EU, bang on the table if that is what it takes, and get a deal that will accord support in this House and get us out of the European Union on the 29th of March next year? Prime Minister. I assure my honourable friend that is exactly what we are intending to do, and he is absolutely right. And I see many messages coming in to me from people who voted uh, Remain, but now say, actually, we accept, we accept the result of the vote. Let's get on with it and let's leave the European Union. Mike Gapes. Mr Speaker, the uh, European Commission has made it absolutely clear that they are not going to reopen the 585-page withdrawal agreement. So if the Prime Minister was able to get an aspirational addendum to the political declaration, a piece of paper that she could wave when she came back. Would that mean we would definitely have a vote on Monday or Tuesday next week? As I've said earlier, the timing of the vote will be determined by the extent of and nature of the discussions with the European Union. Bob Stewart. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Changing tack a little, will my right honourable friend assure me that the pro proposed new deep and special relationship on defence, security and intelligence matters mentioned in the draft withdrawal agreement will not affect our special dealings with other five eyes nations especially the United States. Yes, I'm very happy to give my honourable friend that absolute assurance. Angela Smith. Surely the Prime Minister realises that this House must be given a reasonable period of time in which to reflect on the vote and take its decision. The new year is too late. 7th yeah. of January is just 14 days before the all-important deadline. Yeah. So surely the vote must come before this House, before the end of next week. As I, as I said earlier, obviously we will be working hard in relation to negotiations, but I'm sure honourable members of this House, as a number have indicated, would want to make sure that we are putting our case in the most forceful way. Helen Waitley. Thank you, Mr Speaker. On Friday, I visited a haulage business in my constituency, and the owner told me how worried he is about the possibility of no deal and how it will affect his business. Yeah. Does my right honourable friend agree that when we come to vote on the withdrawal agreement, we must remember not only the importance of honouring the referendum result, but also the importance of people's jobs and livelihoods that depend yeah. on trade yeah. with the yeah. European yeah. Union? Yeah. Minister. I, I, I say to my honourable friend that I think it is very important both that we do deliver on the result of the referendum, but we recognise the need to do that in a way that enables us to leave in a smooth and orderly way, and that does indeed protect those many jobs which depend on the relationship, uh, trading relationship with the European Union. Peter Grant. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I've been reflecting on the fact that the referendum that I took part in as an 18-year-old first-time voter in 1979 in which Scotland voted yeah, to return yeah. its Parliament. If the EU referendum had been subject to the same rules, we would not be leaving now. Ah. But does the Prime Minister not accept that the difficulty in getting an acceptable trade deal, the difficulty in resolving the problem of the Irish border, is not the fault of the Irish, North or South, it's not the fault of Europe, yeah. it's the fault of the red lines that she unilaterally and unnecessarily yeah. set right at the yeah. start. Yeah. If the Prime Minister will not accept that it's time for the red lines to go, surely it's time for the Prime Minister to go. Yeah. Prime Minister. Uh, the, uh, what this government has been negotiating, what is present in the deal, is a good future relationship in trading terms, in relation to the, uh, the border, uh, and in relation to not being a member of the customs union, not being a member of the single market, delivering on the vote of the referendum. And I believe that's what we should be doing for the people of this country. Bima Falami. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I agree with my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, when she says a no deal would be bad for the UK, but it would also be bad for the European Union. Um, and with that in mind, would my right honourable friend agree with me 
that the European Union, as they and their diplomats watch this debate, need to really decide whether they want a deal or not. Because without changes to the backstop, a deal will not pass this House. My honourable friend has made an important point. I believe from all my discussions with the European Union leaders that they do indeed want a deal, but he is absolutely right. It's about recognising the concerns that remain in relation to the backstop to ensure there is a deal that this House will accept. Mr David Simpson. Can I remind the Prime Minister that assurances will not deliver the people of Northern Ireland on this deal? No assurances will. And will she go further and admit tonight that in order to get the deal as far as she has got the deal, that Northern Ireland had to be made the sacrificial lamb to placate the Irish Republic and the EU? No, that is absolutely not the case. What has happened throughout these negotiations is that this United Kingdom government has been very aware of the responsibility that we have to the people of Northern Ireland, and it is that responsibility which leads us to want to ensure that in the circumstances set out in the withdrawal agreement it will be possible to assure people in Northern Ireland that there is no hard border between them and Ireland. Andrew Percy. Can I say, representing a heavy Leave voting Northern constituency, and as somebody who actually lives in their constituency uh, in the North, that my voters, Leave voters, are sick to the back teeth of being told by Remainers, people who lost the referendum, what it was they voted for. We've been told we're racist, that we're a bit stupid, a bit too Northern, and now we're being told we didn't know what we voted for. Can I say my constituents are none of those things, and what they can see going on in this place is a stitch-up by people who said they accepted the result of the referendum, who are using every single trick in the book to deny the people what they voted for. My my honourable friend speaks with passion on behalf of his constituents, and he is right to do so. And I think it is is frankly unacceptable for members in this House to try to suggest to people that they simply didn't understand what they were voting for. The people of this country understood what they were voting for. They knew what they wanted in terms of leaving the European Union, and we should listen to that and deliver on it. Mr David Hanson. Uh, But given it is the Prime Minister's red lines that have originally caused the problem in Northern Ireland, can she give some assurances that she will turn those lines pink to ensure we have free and frictionless trade? Yeah. Can I say to the right honourable gentleman, this, this is a, a theme that has been raised by a number of uh, members on the opposition ben- benches. It is not the case. What, the, the, what we have said with Northern Ireland is that we remain committed to the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, that we remain committed to no hard border between Northern Ireland and Ireland, and that we refuse to accept the European Union's approach of carving Northern Ireland out as a separate customs territory from the rest of the United Kingdom. Hugh Merriman. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister has been on her feet taking questions for 11 hours with regard to this deal. It may not have escaped her attention, it is only one of my constituents, that honourable members across this House, on the one hand, speak for the people with a second referendum, on the other hand, speak for the people when they want a no deal. That can't obviously be correct. Would she agree with me that when it comes to leadership, we need the art of compromise? She has shown that. The European Union has shown that. If Parliament wishes to take control, we need to show compromise as well. Otherwise, we will be responsible for the damage that ensues to our constituents. My honourable friend is absolutely right. In any negotiation, it is necessary to compromise. It is necessary to know what your vital interests are and to stick to these, but to be willing to compromise in order to achieve those vital interests. And it is for all of us to recognise the damage that can be done for our constituents if this House does not uh, deliver on the referendum and do it in a way that protects people's jobs and livelihoods. Owen Smith. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, since the Prime Minister has been on her feet this afternoon, the pound has fallen to its lowest level since early 2017. The FTSE 250 has fallen to its lowest level for two years as a direct consequence of uncertainty caused by this failed brinksmanship. Isn't it grossly irresponsible of the Prime Minister to tell the country that we do not know when we will have a vote on this and this uncertainty may continue indefinitely? Of course. 
uh, there has, and as people look at this House and hear people talking about the possibility of a second referendum, the possibility of a general election, all of which would increase uncertainty, increase division, and increase the problems of this country. If you want. Now, Julian Knight. Mr. Speaker, the average Land Rover, parts and average Land Rover, cross the continent 37 times. My 9,000 car workers need an orderly withdrawal from the EU. Yeah, yeah. Does my right honourable friend agree with me that ultimately, if a withdrawal agreement is rejected, we may get no deal, a permanent, not temporary Norway, or a stain on the soul of this House? a second referendum. I think my honourable friend puts it very well, and that is why members of this House uh, need to consider the importance of delivering on the referendum, but also the importance of doing it in a way, as he says, that actually protects people's jobs and their, them and their children's futures. Yes. Sam Gima. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister is right to say that we, this House needs to honour the result of the referendum in 2016. And that is why many of us, us in this House embarked, voted to embark on the Article 50 process. The Prime Minister then set a red line in 2017, into which we went into a general election. The direct consequence of that general election was the loss of our majority on this side of the House and the gridlock we see in Parliament today. There is, no, there is no majority for any option in this House, and the Prime Minister haven't gone back to renegotiate and not got anything that this House can accept. I would say that we should not once again be boxed in by our own red lines. We should, it's not Parliament frustrating the will of the people. The general election produced an outcome that cannot lead to a clear decision, in which case we should not be afraid to give it back to the people. Prime Minister. I hear the argument my honourable friend is making, uh, but I say to him that I have answered this question of the people's vote on a number of occasions. And, and he, talks about, he talks about the views of people across this House. Uh, when the time comes, it will be for people across this House to recognise the importance of delivering on that vote that took place in 2016. We're streeting. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister talks about trust and faith in politics and the importance of honouring the vote in 2016. But what does she think it will do to trust in politics when those voters realise the deal she's negotiated bears so little resemblance to what they voted for? What will it do when people realise that we'll be subjected to EU rules but with no say over them? Yeah. What will it do when they realise that initially we can't trade with the rest of the world and even when we can, it won't substitute for the trade she's sacrificed around yeah. the negotiating table? And worst of all, what will it do to trust in politics when they're feeling the pain and they're subjected to what she's negotiated and they've been given no say over it whatsoever. If she believes that this is in the national interest and it commands public support, why won't she ask the people? Prime Minister. People voted to end the jurisdiction of the European Court, to end free movement, to end sending vast annual sums to the European Union every, every year, and that is what this deal delivers. Richard Graham. Mr Speaker, I respect the Prime Minister's efforts to try and get the reassurances on the backstop to deliver the referendum, which was, let us remember, a manifesto commitment for both Conservative and Labour members of this House. But does she agree with me that those members who hope that this leads to no deal should realise the House will not support that outcome and any other deal will not honour the referendum in a meaningful way. Snatching parliamentary defeat out of the jaws of referendum victory would be bad for trust, Absolutely. but not impossible if enough members fail to get behind the Government's proposals. Absolutely. Right. I Minister. Think my, my honourable friend has uh, put the... Uh, facts very clearly in relation to this House, and that is why I spoke in my statement of the responsibility that this House has, responsibility to deliver on the referendum, to do it in a way that does protect pe pe people's jobs and futures, and to recognise the importance of the vote that people will take uh, and its impact on people's trust in our politics. Lillian Greenwood. This morning, a prominent Nottingham business warned me that a no-deal Brexit could put them out of business. This afternoon, the Prime Minister raised the threat of an accidental no-deal. Yeah. It is crystal clear that her deal cannot command a majority in this House whenever we vote on it. 
Isn't her time-wasting delay simply reckless? Hear, hear. Minister. No, and honourable members of this House who don't wish to have no deal need to recognise that the only way to have no deal, not to have no deal, is to have a deal and to agree a deal. And there is no agreement, there is no agreement on any alternative deal in this House. Alberto Costa. Thank you, Mr Speaker. There is one part of the agreement that it is incontestable that must be legally binding sooner rather than later, and that is the issue of citizens' rights. Can the Prime Minister reassure this House that, as she speaks to EU leaders, if the ugly spectre of no deal arises, will she reinforce her efforts to ensure that a legally binding agreement on citizens' rights can be brought before this House as soon as possible. Well, can Minister. I thank my honourable friend? He has um, uh, championed the rights of uh, citizens' rights of those EU citizens living in the UK consistently throughout this uh, throughout this process. Uh, can I assure him that we have been stepping up to the plate in relation to citizens' rights in a No Deal scenario? And, and my uh, right honourable friend, the uh, exiting the EU secretary, has. Uh, reminded me that actually a notification was issued last week on that matter. But of course we should remember those one million UK citizens living in EU member states, EU twenty seven member states, and encourage other member states to extend the same generosity to those UK citizens. Kevin Brennan. Mr Speaker, can the Prime Minister just tell the House straight if this is true, that when she comes back with her assurances, it'll still be the case that not a single word in the 585-page withdrawal agreement will have been changed. Is that correct? Yeah. Prime Minister. I have answered this question previously. We are going into negotiations with the European Union. We have negotiated a deal with the European Union. We are looking at ways in which it will be possible to provide the necessary reassurance for members of this House, and we will explore the options. Matt Warman. The constituencies have voted more heavily to leave the European Union than any other. And when I talk to constituents, the feeling I get is that more people now would vote to leave than when they first had the vote in 2016. For the sake of democracy, I would be one of them now as well. Does the Prime Minister agree with me that it should fill our constituents with horror when members of Parliament who stood on manifestos to deliver Brexit now talk of a second referendum? I absolutely agree with my honourable friend, and indeed I receive messages from people who across the country voted to remain who say exactly as he has. They would now vote to leave because, because they believe in the importance of, of recognising and honouring the result of the referendum. Leila Moran. Very much, Mr. Speaker. The Prime Minister today asks if this House wants to deliver Brexit. Well, I'm more interested in if my constituents do. Since she brought this deal to this House, 85% of the letters that I've received are in favour of a people's vote with the option to remain. And she further says we need to be honest about those risks. Well, I can tell her that my constituents know very well those risks. They are dismayed at the mess here, and they now consider it very much the least worst option. By denying the people of Oxford, Western Abingdon, and others across this country their will, is she suggesting that they don't know what they're asking for? No, what I am saying to the Honourable Lady and to and, uh, many members of this House will also be receiving uh, responses from people across the country who are making the point that they voted in the referendum and that they expect Parliament to deliver on the result of the referendum rather than having a second vote. Chris Phil. Hey, Mr Speaker. In the Prime Minister's statement earlier, she, in relation to the backstop, she made clear she had listened to the views of the House. That is a mark of true leadership, and she has done exactly the right thing. But the Prime Minister will also acknowledge that following the Attorney General's statement last week, many members of the House on both sides have concerns about the legally binding nature of the backstop and the fact we require European Union consent to get out of it. Um, does she therefore agree that any changes to the arrangements designed to reassure the House have to be legally enforceable? I'm, I'm well aware of the concerns of the House about the legal enforceability on this issue and the desire to ensure that anything that is uh, 
what people have been saying to me is that they want to ensure that the backstop can be brought to an end, and there are various ways in which we can do that. What we need to negotiate, what we what, um, will be discussing with the European Union, is the whole question of how we can do that in a way that does give sufficient reassurance and sufficient confidence to members of this House that they are not faced with a situation where they have one aspect of this which is an, under one determination and another aspect which is less secure. It is giving that confidence to members of this House that we will be negotiating. Paula Sheriff. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I believe the Prime Minister, who incidentally just last year promised us, promised us a strong and stable administration, I believe she attended a lunch today where she said she thought that her deal was the be- best available. What does she know now that she didn't know then? Minister. I have been very clear that the deal, uh, what we are looking at is one aspect of the deal which we had tr- uh, negotiated a ways of addressing it within the withdrawal agreement. What has been proved is that the ways that were negotiated in that withdrawal agreement have not been sufficient to give confidence to members of this House. The European Union has been clear that the backstop is only temporary, but people want further confidence that it will be only temporary, that it can be brought to an end, and that is what we will be negotiating and discussing with the European Union. Thank you, Kevin Foster. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I welcome the general tenor of the Prime Minister's remarks today. When she goes to meet European leaders, will she be making clear that this is not about anyone wanting to return to the borders of the past in Ireland? This is about wanting to make sure that we will have the sovereign ability to choose our own trading destiny future and that we won't be subject to potential vetoes on extraneous issues that have nothing to do with keeping a border open in Ireland. Yes. No, my honourable friend Minister. puts it very well. Uh, I think it is important that we uh, remind the European Union that we are committed to no hard border between Northern Ireland and Ireland, but we are also committed, as they have reflected and respected in the political declaration, to having an independent trade policy. And it is important that the policies we have to deliver on no hard border enable us to operate that independent trade policy. Stuart Malcolm Macdonald. Thank you, Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. The art of diplomacy is known as allowing someone else to have your way. So given that failure on the government's part, when a government can't get through its central piece of legislation, shouldn't it stand aside? And if it doesn't, shouldn't the Leader of the Opposition put forward a no-confidence motion? Because I suspect if she was sat where the Right Honourable Member for North Islington is sat, she would do the exact same. Can I, can I simply point out to the honourable gentleman? He talks about legislation. Of course, the meaningful vote is not in itself legislation. The legislation follows with the withdrawal agreement bill that we put before. The, he says he didn't mention it. He did actually use the term legislation uh, in what the government is doing. What we what we are doing what we are doing is ensuring that we have listened to members of this house and that we are holding those further discussions with the European Union to deliver on the mem- on the, the uh, views of this house. Now, Rachel McLean. Thank you, Mr. Yeah, Speaker. Yeah. I'd like to speak up for something that seems to be going out of fashion, which is compromise and pragmatism in order to bring yeah, yeah, the country yeah, yeah, back yeah. together. Doesn't she agree with me that members on the opposite side need to respect the manifesto that they stood on, yeah, yeah. which was to deliver the result of the referendum? I, 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 Stop playing party politics with their own constituents absolutely. and back the deal because absolutely. they say they don't favour a no yeah, deal. Yeah, and yeah, get Order, yeah. order, order, order noise. The honourable lady must be heard. Rachel McLean. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I merely ask the Prime Minister if she agrees that the opposition need to support her deal to deliver what they promised to their constituents. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. The, op- the official opposition, as the Conservative Party did, stood on a mas- manifesto to deliver on the referendum and should do exactly that. <laughs> Rachel Maskell. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In the light that the Prime Minister and her government have led these negotiations for 29 months, what are the exact terms the Prime Minister is wanting to negotiate with the EU this week? I think I've, I've answered this on several occasions. It is in relation to the uh, backstop and ensuring that it is not uh, permanent or indefinite, but it can only be temporary. Bill Grant. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. All members of this House are here as a result of a democratic vote. Would my right honourable friend agree that is at best mystifying that many such members refuse to honour or indeed respect 
the democratic outcome of the referendum, and in some cases, two referendums. Yeah. Yeah. Can I say to my, my honourable friend, my, my honourable friend, I absolutely agree with him. Sadly, th- there are members of this House who appear not to want to deliver on the result of the referendum in 2016. Uh, sadly, there are also members of this House who seem not to want to accept the result of the referendum that took place in 2014 in Scotland. Jack yeah. 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 Um, Mr Speaker, the Government's mishandling of the negotiations has thrust the country into chaos, with growing uncertainty and deep concern in our automotive sector, in, including the Jaguar plant in my constituency. Mr Speaker, we are but three months away from the cliff. Whatever the ultimate way forward agreed by this House is at the next stages, will the Prime Minister today rule out any question of a no-deal Brexit, because the jobs of tens of thousands of workers depend upon it. Honourable gentlemen, I have been clear that I believe that the best route forward for the UK is to leave with a good deal for with the European Union. That is what we have negotiated, and that is a deal that recognises the importance of the trading relationship to many jobs across this country, including in the automotive industry. But if, if this House desires not to have no deal, then this House needs to accept a deal, and the best deal on the table is the one the Government has negotiated. Andrew Bowie. Very much, Mr. Speaker. Earlier on, the member for Ponty Preed spoke about his concerns for the economy and what's happened to the pound today. Does my right honourable friend not agree that this is as nothing as to what would happen to our economy under the economically illiterate, destructive, and chaotic policies of a Labour government propped up by the SNP? Yeah. Yes, yes, my, my honourable friend is absolutely right. The flight of capital and the run on the pound, which the Labour Party themselves accept would be the impact of their economic policies, would be the worst damage that could be inflicted on this economy. Dr Roberta Blackman Woods. I'm one of the few people in this House brought up in Northern Ireland during mm. the years of conflict, and I don't ever want to see a return to that time. So how is the Prime Minister going to ensure no hard border in Ireland now or in a few years' time, and absolutely no undermining of the Good Friday Agreement that brought such welcome peace? And surely this negotiation should not be about the Prime Minister trying to prepare enough people on her own side to heave this bad deal over the line. It should be about the long-term peace and prosperity in Northern Ireland yeah, and the yeah. rest of the UK too. Minister. It is that long-term peace and prosperity, not only of Northern Ireland but the whole of the United Kingdom, that has underpinned the approach the Government has taken to the whole of these negotiations. We remain firmly committed to ensuring that the peace process that has been so important to the lives of people in Northern Ireland, that the, the uh, peace that has been achieved and the development in Northern Ireland that has been achieved can continue into the future and give the people of Northern Ireland the bright future that we, that, uh, we can also give to people across the whole of the United Kingdom. Having no hard border between Northern Ireland and Ireland is an important part of maintaining that process into the future. Alex Jaw. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Isn't the public entitled to a grown-up acknowledgement across this House that the issue of the backstop affects both policies, whether it's the Prime Minister's proposal or indeed the opposition proposal to stay in the customs union or outside the single market, both require a backstop. Does she agree? My humble friend is absolutely right. Any of the alternative arrangements that have been put out in contrast to uh, the government's deal also require a backstop. The backstop is there in the circumstances where the negotiations fail to achieve the future relationship in time uh, at the end of the transition period, and that could happen in the negotiation of any of the agreements. Ian Murray. Thank you, Mr Speaker. This ongoing farce would be funny if it wasn't so serious for the jobs and prosperity of my constituents in Edinburgh South. The Prime Minister rightly says she wants to be honest with the public. So can she be honest? Is her deal non-negotiable? We have, negoci- we have negotiated the uh, deal with the European Union, which covers many aspects over and above this issue of the backstop. The one that colleagues have, that members of this House have raised concerns about is the particular aspect of the uh, backstop in relation to whether or not it can be indefinite or is only temporary. And it is that specific point on which we are seeking those reassurances. 
Raymond Chishti. Mr Speaker, like many other colleagues, I was hoping to speak in this debate and outline my reasons why I'd be opposing this debate and voting against that. Can the Prime Minister clarify this specific point for me? She's talked about manifesto commitments. Can I refer the Prime Minister to page 36 of the Conservative <coughs> Party manifesto, which says, as we leave the European Union, we will no longer be members of the single market and the customs union. How does that reconcile with the deal that we have and the Attorney General's advice on paragraph 7 on the customs union and single market? It, it is indeed reconciled with the fact that the future de uh, uh, relationship we will have with the European Union will ensure that we are not in the single market and not in the customs union. The, uh, and indeed, in the, in the withdrawal agreement uh, in, in relation to the backstop in Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland will not be in the full single market. And the, with, the point about the backstop is it is only intended to be temporary. The ab absence coming out of the single market, coming out of the customs union, coming out of all the other aspects of the uh, uh, European Union membership that people voted uh, against and wanted to see us come out of uh, is delivered in the future relationship we have with the European Union. Christine Jardine. Mr Speaker, there are two small points from today's debate I wonder if the Prime Minister could clarify. The first is that in anticipation of speaking in this afternoon's debate, like many other members, including those on her own benches, I gauged the opinion of my constituents in Edinburgh West. Implicit in that, as in the Prime Minister's statement that she has listened to what the House said and is going back to, to uh, review the backstop, is an acknowledgement that people can change their mind. Yeah. So that being the case, why is the Prime Minister not prepared to let the country see whether or not they've changed their mind? And could she please clarify the point raised by my honourable friend from Wellingborough about the mechanism she's going to use over this afternoon's debate? Yeah. Can I say to the Honourable Lady that there will be a business statement after this statement has uh, finished? And in relation to the first point about going back to the country with a second referendum, I think I, I uh, refer her to the answer I've given to the same question earlier. Simon Hall. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Can I tell my right honourable friend that in all of my discussions with businesses and farmers in my North Dorset constituency, they desperately want a deal. So I support the instincts of my right honourable friend. But given that we are told that the technology exists within the world that would deliver a robust, non-hard border policy compliant within the transition period, does she believe that the backstop is potentially being overblown in terms of it being anything other than the insurance policy that all parties require to safeguard that precious peace which so many right honourable and honourable members have spoken of. Well, my honourable friend is absolutely right. The withdrawal agreement now references the possibility of those alternative arrangements which can deliver on the no hard border, which is so important for the peace he, he references. Uh, and that indeed could mean that the backstop does genuinely does not need to be used. Uh, and there's been a lot of focus on the backstop, but given there's the possibility of extending the transition period and given the existence of alternative arrangements, those both make it even less likely that backstop would ever come into, into force. Yes. Christian Matheson. The tactic employed by the Prime Minister of trying to foment division between this House and the country outside is to be deeply regretted and will only add to the, the, to the problems that she's described elsewhere uh, in her statement. Uh, can she tell us, um, is the deal that is currently sitting on the table of this House now dead since she is trying to go and renegotiate something that was previously unnegotiable? First of all, it is not. Uh, we're not trying to foment division between this House and the people. Oh, no. Every member of this House has a responsibility to understand what I believe is a duty to deliver on the vote of the referendum. A number of members of this House are indicating that they would prefer to follow a different route than delivering on that uh, referendum vote. I believe that we have a duty to deliver on that uh, referendum vote, and as I have explained, I believe the deal that has been negotiated is the right deal for the UK. There is this aspect of, on relation to the backstop on which we will be going back to the European Union. Jim Shannon. Yeah, no. Prime Minister. 
I said during one of your previous statements that Northern Ireland will not be your sacrifice. You have stated uh, that there must be compromise, but the state of Northern Ireland is an absolute, and the tinkering that has taken place is not acceptable. Regretfully, Prime Minister, so none of your words today have reassured this House in the gap of mistrust between yourself and myself and the DUP has grown into a chasm. It is very clear it has never been so low. So, Prime Minister, I support the majority of the UK and ask you, Prime Minister, to do what was asked of you, leave the EU as we entered it, with no backstop and on our own merits and confident of our ability as a global power and no man's slave. Can I say to the honourable gentleman that we do indeed want to deliver on leaving the European Union, but in doing that I want to reassure and ensure that there will be no hard border between Northern Ireland and Ireland. I believe that that is important, as I am sure the honourable gentleman does, for his constituents and for the future of Northern Ireland, and that should be one of the, commit- it's one of the commitments we have given and it is one of the commitments I intend to deliver on. Alison Hewless. Hey, Mr. Speaker. Over the weekend, I have had hundreds of constituents getting in touch with me, asking me to vote down this terrible deal, this woeful deal that the Prime Minister has come back with. There is no... There is no... Stop heckling. Could stop interrupt. Order, order. The Honourable Lady is here. I say to the Government Minister, standing at the bar, be quiet. I have not the slightest interest in hearing you yelling in the background. Sit down, be quiet and listen, and if you're not able or inclined to do that, sir, order! If you're not able or inclined, don't look at me and tell me what's what or imply that you can. I say to you, be quiet. Don't be discourteous to the member on her feet. If you can't be quiet, Mr Stewart, you're most welcome to leave the chamber, and we're perfectly capable of coping without you. Alison Hewless. Mr Speaker, there is no confidence in this Prime Minister's deal. She doesn't have the confidence of her backbenchers, of my constituents or the majority of people in this House. She can't even tell us a date when this vote will will return to the House. Is it not the case, Mr Speaker, that this Prime Minister has bottled it and she should go? I think uh, I have to say to the Honourable Lady that if I was bottling it, I wouldn't have come to this chamber and have been on my feet already for nearly two and a half hours. Clive Efford. Mr Speaker, the Taoiseach Leo Varadka is quoted today as saying we have already offered a lot of concessions. We ended up with the backstop because of all of the red lines the UK laid down. The the EU leaders know that we have the backstop that was designed by the Prime Minister. Just exactly what is she going to renegotiate? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I have to say to the honourable gentleman, it, this is not a backstop that was designed by the United Kingdom. This is a backstop. The, the one aspect of this backstop, the one aspect of this backstop, which was uh, required by the United Kingdom, was ensuring that the customs territory was UK wide and that we did not see a Northern Ireland customs territory. Uh, and that was what the EU wanted. We stood up against it and we delivered. Carol Monaghan. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, the, the Prime Minister and many on her benches have demonstrated an astounding ignorance of the history of these isles, so attempting to bully Ireland into a perceived compliance by threatening fo- food supplies is utterly abhorrent. Yeah, yeah. So, can the Prime Minister assure the House? that in any conversations, negotiations or interactions taking place, Ireland will be considered unequal. Here, here. Well, I, can I say to the hon. Lady, the Government has not suggested what she uh, uh, suggested in her question that we have done. We have been res- we, 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 Ireland is a, uh, currently a fellow member of the European Union. We, in the future, will not be a member of the European Union, but one of the things that I have discussed with the Taoiseach is actually how we can continue to ensure that our bilateral relations which have been, going, uh, been growing much stronger in recent years, can continue to grow well in the interests of the whole of the United Kingdom, including Northern Ireland. Mr Andrew Slaughter. Speaker, dragging the decision on her deal into the new year for what looks like tactical advantage is unfair yeah. on everyone. Yeah. But it's particularly unfair on businesses trying to plan for their future yeah. and for EU citizens who want to know their rights yeah. going forward. Will she at least 
promise to bring that vote before the Christmas recess. Yeah. One of the important elements, of course, of the deal that we've negotiated is being able to give EU citizens the confidence about their rights. We have done that even in the circumstances of a no deal. Uh, 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 should there be a no deal, and um, what is important for certainty for the future and what will deliver all of these things for, fu- for the future is actually this House agreeing a deal. Yeah. Kerry McCarthy. I have had hundreds of constituents emailing me to express their unhappiness with the Prime Minister's deal. and They are not troubled by the backstop. They are worried about their jobs, the economy, whether they will be able to get their hands on life-saving medicines, whether food prices will go through the roof. It is self-indulgent in the extreme for us to be here putting off this decision day after day after day while the Prime Minister tries to save her own skin. Can, she will not be able to come back with a deal that satisfies me that my constituents will not be worse off. Off. Can she just get on with it? Yeah. That's actually what I am doing: is getting on with finding a way through. Yes, with listening to members of this house and then uh, going back to negotiate on those, that basis. But I say to the honourable lady, I say to the honourable lady that the deal, the deal has been negotiated with the European Union. If she wants to avoid the circumstances of a no deal, then she has to accept a deal. This is the deal that is on the table. Alex Norris. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It was clear after the Chequers Agreement was announced that there was not a majority in Parliament for it. It's been clear after the withdrawal announcement was, was, was made that there's not a majority in Parliament. It's been clear after three days of debate that there is not a majority of Parliament for the Prime Minister's plan. In that time, we have wasted months. Yes. Now the Prime Minister proposes to wait, waste further weeks. Is the Prime Minister's new strategy to run the clock down to the very last minute to give us a false choice between her deal and the catastrophe of no deal. Hon. Members of this House will need to face the the fact that there will be a choice between a deal, between no deal or no Brexit. Between between a a deal, a deal, no deal or no Brexit. There is no majority in this House for any of the alternative arrangements that have been put forward by members of this House. Daniel Zeichner. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister told us earlier that she'd been listening, but I'm afraid she's been a touch selective in what she's actually heard, because it's not just about the backstop. And can she level with the country and tell them that, actually, the political declaration isn't a deal, it's a series of shared aspirations, and the negotiations are likely to drag on for years and years and years. The uh, political declaration makes it very clear that this is uh, that what will be negotiated will give effect to what is in the political declaration. If you like, it's instructions to the negotiators. What is also clear within the uh, within the deal that has been agreed is that both sides will use their best endeavours, acting in good faith, to achieve that negotiation by the end of December 2020. <laughs> Dr. Rupa Hak. Mr Speaker, nine times the Prime Minister assured us that there would be no early general election, and still it happened. As recently as this morning, her hapless, ever-changing band of ministers were out on the airwaves assuring us that there would be a meaningful vote tomorrow before this latest twist, this sort of premature parliamentary ejaculation that has put the lie to the claim that she sticks to her guns. When she won't even tell us when the vote is deferred to, and it appears that the lady is for turning. How can we or anyone trust anything she says again? <laughs> I'm tempted to say to the Honourable Lady, if she looks carefully, I think she'll see that I'm not capable of a parliamentary ejaculation. <laughs> Thank you. Deirdre Brock. Mr. Speaker. However, at a quarter of the four this afternoon, I received a written answer that stated the Northern Ireland Protocol guarantees that even in the event that the UK's future relationship with the EU is not in place by the end of the implementation period, there will be no hard border between Northern Ireland and Ireland and no splitting of the UK's customs territory. In so doing, the agreement preserves the economic and constitutional integrity of the UK, upholds the Belfast Good Friday Agreement and ensures people's and business, people and businesses that rely on an open border between Northern Ireland and Ireland can continue living their lives and operating as they do now. 
Does the Prime Minister agree? <laughs> yes, that's what we've negotiated to ensure there will be no hard border between Northern Ireland and Ireland. <laughs> Anna McMorrin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. World leaders are gathering in Katowice in Poland this week to agree action on climate change, the single biggest issue <coughs> facing us in the world to date. But instead, here we are, embroiled in a massive uh, act of self harm. With unable to move forward, the pound at its lowest point in 18 months, locked in a stalemate, without any majority in Parliament for a deal, please put this back to the people. Not for the first time, not for the second time, but for the first time on this deal. I refer to the honourable lady to the answer I've, uh, I've given her earlier. I would also point out to her that if she wants the government to be able to get on uh, and focus uh, on the issues that she's talking about, we have representation in Katowice. We are still working on the issues of climate change and other things. But going back on a second, uh, second referendum will not help that process. Will. Nick Dakin. Speaker, the Prime Minister admits that if she put the deal to this House tomorrow, it would be rejected by, in her words, a significant margin. So why is she behaving like the shopkeeper in the Deb Parrot sketch and insisting that this did deal is not yet deceased? <laughs> Because, as I've pointed out, there is a specific reason why people have raised concerns about the negotiation. It is about the issue of the temporary nature or otherwise of the backstop, and that is what we are going back to the European Union to discuss. Dr Philippa Whitford. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. At the beginning of this process, the Prime Minister said she would reach out right across the UK to the devolved nations across the divide and agree a negotiating position before going to Europe. But she didn't. She made all the decisions herself, painted herself into a, into a corner with her red lines, and what we have in front of us is a blind Brexit. We won't be putting this behind us for years because that 26 pages is just blather. It is nothing. It is clear that the fact that the Prime Minister won't allow MPs to vote and won't allow people to vote is that she's no faith in this deal herself. Is that not closer to the case? No, it is not. And it is not the case that MPs are not going to be allowed to vote. There will be a vote in this House. There will be a vote in this House, but we will be negotiating on that issue of the backstop. Brendan O'Hara. I spent much of the weekend reassuring worried farmers, fishermen, distillery workers in my Argyll and Butte constituency that the stark choice being forced upon them between a hard deal and a hard no deal Brexit was a false choice. And today the Prime Minister confirmed that I was right, that it was a false choice. So will she now accept that this was one cruel yeah. bluff too far? And that today, in the eyes of the public, she and her hopelessly divided government yep. have taken self serving political cowardice to a whole oh, new level. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I say to the honourable gentleman uh, that the two of the things that will be delivered by this deal are coming out of the common agricultural policy and coming out of the common fisheries policy. Those are both important for our agricultural sector and for our fishermen because we will be able to deliver improvements for both of those sectors in the future. Mrs Sharon Hodgson. Mr Speaker, even by this government's standards, the events of today have been extraordinary. My constituents will be looking on today in horror at what the Prime Minister is doing. There are just 109 days to go until we are due to leave the EU, and the PM d Prime Minister does not have the confidence to put her own deal to a vote of this House. Every day this chaos con continues, it damages the country. As the Prime Minister, Mr Speaker, does not command a majority of this House any longer, will she step aside? Yeah. Yeah. No, what we are doing is ensuring that we can have a deal which, uh, look, for the confidence and certainty that her constituents want, I believe that it is absolutely it is important that this country agrees a deal that delivers for them on their jobs and livelihoods in the future, and that is what this deal does. Kate Green. The Prime Minister said that it was disquiet about the backstop in this House that was uh, leading her to return to the European Union. 
but many of the 164 speeches that we've heard so far in this debate indicate that it is not just the backstop that is of concern, and it's also the case that my constituents have many other concerns about the deal that is on the table. So can the Prime Minister say to us when she is going to put this intrinsically unsatisfactory deal before this House so that we can vote on it? Here, 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 here. I refer the Honourable Lady to the answer I gave earlier. Ms McInnes. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister has rather given the game away with her statement today. For as long as we fail to agree a deal, the risk of an accidental no deal yeah. increases. Yeah. Yes. It would be monumental folly of any government to accidentally stumble into no deal. We've had three days of debate. Let's have the next two and let's have a vote on her deal. Yeah. 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 This is, this is something that is a responsibility for members of this House when they come to look at the deal that the Government puts before them, as to recognise what the potential alternatives are in relation to no Brexit or no deal. Drew Hendry. Uh, Mr Speaker, what we have witnessed today is the evaporation of any lingering vapours of credibility from this Prime Minister and a government she leads in name only after this cowardly decision to postpone or stop this vote. After two, oh, more than two years of Tory infighting in the back benches and pandering to that and coming up with this mess, isn't it time she now took responsibility? And if the Leader of the Opposition has the backbone to bring a no-confidence vote tomorrow, will she have Stain, or will she do the honourable thing beforehand and resign? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no. Yes. Lloyd Russell Moyle. The Prime Minister last year called an election because she understood clearly that in democracies you regularly go back to the people and you have a vote. After last week of her losing three votes in Parliament, she seems to have gone a bit cold on democracy. She doesn't want a people's vote, OK. She doesn't even want votes now in the House of Commons. When will we get to vote? What date will the Prime Minister set for a vote? Because I have no trust in this Prime Minister, and I don't think the country does either. I refer the honourable gentleman to the answer I gave earlier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You want to do? Oh, I'm just going to stay. Are you going to vote the adjournment? No, I'll do the adjournment. Are you sure? Yeah, yeah. Not on it. Paul Sweeney. Can the Prime Minister just accept that the fundamental premise of this deal is not going to change, and no matter sugar coating is going to build a majority in this House for a fundamentally dead deal? So will the Prime Minister just face up to the reality of democracy and face the House of Commons, put it to a vote, and allow Parliament to decide what happens next, yeah. instead of holding us all hostage to our own misfortune? Yeah. The, fun the fundamental premise of this deal is a deal that delivers on the referendum, respects the decision taken by the British people, and does so in a way that protects people's jobs and livelihoods for the future. I believe that's the right premise for the deal. Stuart C. Macdonald. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I've heard absolutely nothing that justifies halting our debate, because if the red lines aren't going to change, then the deal is not going to be changed materially either. In the last few minutes, Donald Tusk has confirmed that the deal and the backstop cannot be renegotiated. Yep. Yep. So if the Prime Minister is intent on listening to this House, will she confirm that we will have a vote on whether or not to halt our debate? Yeah. Yeah, an excellent yeah. question. No, I have set out the uh, position in my statement, and there will be a business statement to the House later. Janet Davey. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it's good to hear that the Prime Minister has said that she is listening. But if indeed she is listening, what would she say to my constituent who voted in line with the Leave campaign and has said that he felt miserably misled and misinformed by that campaign and has since said that he would like to make an informed decision like many others and have the opportunity to have a people's vote? I say to the Honourable Lady that I... I uh, have given an answer in relation to the people's vote on a number of occasions. I think 17.4 million people voted to leave the European Union. There are many people now who, uh, she cites her constituents, there are many other constituents who, having voted actually to remain, would now vote to leave the European Union because they believe it's important for government and parliament to deliver on that referendum. Mr Graham Jones. Speaker, Prime Minister, was this the easiest deal in history? <laughs> <laughs> I, 
say to the, the Honourable Gentleman, I think he, if he looks back on the various statements I've made about tough negotiations and difficult choices being made, he will know the answer to that question. Chris Elmore. Mr Speaker, the only thing the Prime Minister has been consistent about in recent months is that her deal is the only deal on the table. So the reality is nothing will change with tweaking with bits and pieces, as has been confirmed by the tea shop for a start. So in that vein, can she confirm that a decision to de- delay tomorrow's vote does not mean that the requirement under the e-withdrawal Act for a government to make a statement by the 21st of January, if this House has not approved a deal, has not changed? <laughs> no, the, the, the legislation is clear on the position, and the government un- understands that. Yes or no? Mary Rimmer. Mr. Speaker, the referendum was honoured when this chamber voted our Article 50 through. The deal on offer or no deal are seriously detrimental to this country, with the most vulnerable of people set to be the one worst hit again. It is truth and honesty that is desperately needed in this country now. The people are entitled to it. It takes a brave person to be a true leader. But will you rise to the challenge and tell this chamber and the public that this deal and the no deal are seriously detrimental and get out to the people? We cannot leave them over a cliff like lemmings. The the, the, the Honourable Lady started her remark, uh, her intervention and question to me by saying that this House had delivered on the vote of the refer- respected the result of the referendum when it triggered article 50 uh, the, the, if she follows through that issue you know, what article triggering article 50 did was start the process of negotiation we will honor the, the result of the referendum when we leave the european union baby abrams mr speaker i have no confidence whatsoever in the prime minister renegotiating the uh, deal amending the deal for backstop or anything else but given that the Prime Minister has refused to date to, give, to name when we may have a vote on this amended deal, will she at least stop the clock on, article, on the Article 50 process? Or is it really a threat, as it seems to have been in the response to many of my colleagues, a threat of, a, of her deal or no deal? Yeah. We've, we've, triggered the article, we've triggered the Article 50 process. Oh, I believe that we have a responsibility to deliver on the vote of the referendum. We put the exit date into legislation uh, in this. Uh, this Parliament put the exit date into legislation, and we will be leaving on the 29th of March next year. Ruth yeah. George. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister says that she wants certainty and protection for jobs and prosperity. But seeing as she's just about to try and ditch the only legally binding part of the future relationship, and she has a party which is seeking to ditch her and take us into a hard Brexit, what guarantee does her deal give to businesses and people in my constituency of of jobs and prosperity that they want? What I say to the Honourable Lady, I think she seems to have misunderstood what I said in my statement when she says we're abandoning, in to- appears to think we're abandoning in total the legally binding aspect of the, uh, of the deal that has been agreed. She talks about protecting jobs. That's exactly why we have negotiated and set out very clearly that ambitious free trade agreement for the future and the free trade area that would enable us to protect jobs up and down the country. <laughs> Alan Brown. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. After two years of telling us no deal is better than a bad deal, since Silk's Her Intelligence has been telling us a no deal is so catastrophic, we've got to vote for her bad deal. <laughs> and yet, at the same time, she says, don't worry, we've prepared for a no deal. The reality is, when it comes to a no deal, she had a Brexit secretary that didn't know how important the Port of Dover was. A Transport Secretary did not bother to visit the Port of Dover since June 2016 till October 2018. That's how far behind they are in no-deal preparations. Isn't she insulting her intelligence further by saying she's ready? Isn't it the fact she's never had control of this situation? Uh, The no-deal preparations will continue, as I said earlier in my statement. Martin Whitfield. Grateful, Mr. Speaker. Donald Tusk has just tweeted that he will not renegotiate anything, including the backstop, but will discuss how the UK will facilitate ratification. Given that a no deal would be a disaster, and the Article 50 hearing this morning stated that we could withdraw it, 
Is it not in the government's power, if we reach a point where there is a no-deal risk, yeah. that the government withdraws Article 50? Yeah. Revoking Article 50 means staying in the European Union. That was not what people voted for in 2016. Yeah. Hugh Gaffney. I can also thank all the MPs on Postal Workers' Day for the extra meal and Brexit. On the morning after the referendum, Prime Minister, you said two and a half years ago, I knew we had witnessed a defining moment in our democracy. Prime Minister, this is a defining moment in our democracy. Your deal has failed. So will you call a general election or will you resign just like David? Yeah. <laughs> Order. Uh, sorry, the Prime Minister will finish her answer. We'll give her answer. Go on, give, give the answer, please. No. Yeah. Uh, can, can I just very gently say to members, in some cases, it may be done for emphasis, in which case it is an abuse, and in some cases it may be inadvertent. But there is a dangerous tendency developing on both sides of the House, and we've witnessed it today, for members to keep using the word you. Debate goes through the chair, and you refers to the chair, and members shouldn't do that. I've been trying to educate the extraordinarily diligent and amiable member for Strangford for several years that he should not say, Minister, will you do this, that or the other? And I don't want the infection to spread, if I can put it that way. Um, Mr Justin Madders. I've had many constituents contact me about the withdrawal agreements, and I had hoped to speak in the debate later on to put forward their views and my own. And the Prime Minister said earlier that she wants to take members' uh, concerns back to the EU, but how can she do that if she shuts the debate down tonight? Or do my constituents' views not count? Yes. Yeah. Good question. Can I, I think I've set out the position that uh, I and the Government are taking in the statement I gave earlier. Thank you. Matt Weston. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister in her statement said that those members who continue to disagree need to shoulder the responsibility of advocating an alternative solution that can be delivered. Mr Speaker, I came here today to make a speech in the debate and to advocate an alternative position and to vote tomorrow. The Prime Minister is clearly running down the clock playing a dangerous game of brinkmanship for our businesses such as Jaguar Land Rover. Does she not accept that by denying Parliament the vote tomorrow, she is preventing any alternative solution to be proposed unless Article 50 is extended? That there are a number of alternatives that members of this House have already put forward in debate, and in, not just in the debate in, uh, that has taken place for the three days so far. Uh, but so far, there has clearly not been any consensus across this House for any alternative arrangement. The House will have to come to a decision about whether to go forward with the deal or not in due course. Yeah. Martin Day. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister has warned the House of the risk of dividing the country and the loss of faith in our democracy. Does she not recognise that if we press on regardless, if we take Scotland out of the EU against their will on the back of a UK-wide vote which was only narrowly won and won with extensive rule-breaking by the Leave campaign, yeah, yeah, yeah. that it does exactly that? And if she hasn't got the guts to put a vote before this House or the people, is it not time for her to resign? Absolutely. Yeah. Can I say to the Honourable Gentleman that, as I explained in the statement, we are deferring the vote so that we can have these further discussions with the European Union. But as I have pointed out to him and to his right honourable and honourable friends on a number of occasions, from the point of view of the economy of Scotland and jobs in Scotland, the most important thing, the most important element of their economy is actually staying within the internal market of the United Kingdom. Order. 